Because we've got some great speakers, and in reality, this is an opportunity to pick their brains. And, and there's some pretty substantial brains in this room, none of them, of, of which are mine, of course. But do take the opportunity. It may be uh, a long time before we have this opportunity again. Morning, welcome. We're normally going to sit at the front, so make your way forward. It's good to be a bit interactive, then. Sitting near the front is going to enable us. Right, so th thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I'm Ben Lamb. I'm a trainee from London. Uh, jo Cresswell is the, my co-course co director. She's a consultant urologist from Middlesbrough. Um, thanks for coming. We're, we're really excited. This is the first research skills course, I think, that BAUS has done in recent times. And um, it's, I think it's going to be a good opportunity for um, consultants to get an idea of how to join into clinical studies and take part in research in their uh, consultant NHS jobs, uh, but also for trainees to perhaps to learn some skills to begin to take part in research, um, maybe in other ways, but you know, we'll all be consultants one day and hopefully this will be able to kick start that process of being involved in research um, as a consultant as well for the trainees. So we hope it will be a useful and an enjoyable experience, and which is why I think we want it to be as interactive as possible. And I'm, I'm sure our faculty will be happy to, you know, field questions and tailor their talks to uh, concerns or issues or suggestions people have. Um, we've got um, permission from BAUS to film the course so that we can use it as an educational resource for trainees and others afterwards. Um, I think everyone should have been emailed with a kind of opt-out if you weren't happy with that. And as far as I know, we've not got anyone who is unhappy with that. So hopefully that's to everyone's satisfaction. It might just be the backs of your heads, though, <laughs> on film. So these are our objectives. Um, so by the end of the course, so half past two, um, we hope you'll have a better understanding of why research is an important part of your clinical practice in, within the NHS or elsewhere. Um, we hope you'll have identified some opportunities for participating in research. Um, we hope you'll be able to have a better idea of how to take a research question and turn it into um, you know, practical ideas of how to, how to do studies to answer that question. Um, often a systematic review is the best place to start, and Graham and Stephen will be you know, giving us some ideas about how to do that. Um, and the outputs of those um, you know, of research, one of the most important is publications. So we hopefully you'll have a, a better understanding of you know what makes an, an attractive paper or publication. So we've got um, can't speak for myself, but an expert faculty. Uh, Joe is the secretary of the um, section of oncology and a consultant in Middlesbrough. Um, at the back we've got Stephen and Graham McLennan, who are statisticians from Aberdeen, who are very well integrated into the urological com community. I think Stephen's led sessions at EAU on systematic reviews. Uh, Graham's been involved in most of the BAUS sections, helping them with their you know, ongoing data and, and other projects. Um, Professor Emberton, I think, needs no introduction, sitting at the front here. And we've got uh, Mika van Hemmelrich, who's an epidemiologist, um, who'll be talking to us about framing a research question, and then Professor Dasgupta, who'll be coming to talk about uh, aspects of publication. So, I think Professor Emberton, you're... Because there's no other clock. Okay. 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 How long do you want me? Fifty. Okay, great. So I'm going to. Oh, we're not. Don't seem to be connected. Okay, great. So um, I'm re really looking forward to this session, uh, but I'm going to change slightly um, the content because um, I just want to just go through an idea and see if we can develop it 
Um, and in each phase of this, I'll kind of try and identify a pearl or a truth about doing research that, um, uh, that I think has some validity and, and some utility. Right? Whether we'll identify those or, or not, I don't know, because I've never done this before. All right, but this is the kind of question that's exercising me at the moment, and one that I've had a discussion with with a couple of patients, um, microbiologist and a clinical epidemiologist, Jan van der Merlen, um, and we're kind of to tossing around right now, and I I'd be really grateful for your input. Um, and, and this was actually the subject of the Hunterian lecture yesterday, so some of you will have seen it. Um, and we know that happens. Um, in a sense, uh, this is really hot. So this was an alert um, from the Center for Disease Control in June 13. All the urological websites in the, in the States now um, are suddenly panicking because, not because antimicrobial resistance exists, but because it exists in America. Um, and, and there's kind of panic stations. Um, we, we, we know it's been in Southeast Asia. There was a case about four months ago in Switzerland, a man with a UTI, and, and this is the kind of first um, chap in the States, and it's changed everything. So big problem, big problem getting worse. Um, so um, significant unmet need here. Do people agree? Why has it taken us so long, do you think, to... Um, do we need the Americans to get interested before we address the question? We've known about trust-related sepsis for a while. May I contribute, Rob? Please, yeah. Cancer is more sexy than UTI. Uh, We'd rather diagnose cancer at risk of uh, propagating severe infections yeah. than the uh, other way around. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, the, the UTIs, they're iatrogenic. We're causing them. They're preventable. Um, we've known about it for a long time, and yet we've done very little research to, um, to address it. Um, I don't need to labor the point, but there's, there's lots of justification that you might put into a grant um, that you can see here, you know, to, to highlight the message to the person that's going to potentially pay for this, that this is more important than the other 16 applications that are sitting on his or her desk. And this is kind of more ammunition, if you like, for you. Um, and the beauty of quotes from eminent people that can kind of populate your argument, either in a lecture or even better, in a grant application in italics at the top, um, just to concentrate the mind and, and to get that reviewer's attention that this is a really important issue. And I, I just I don't need to go on any, any further. And I suppose the... The other thing that you might put in that first paragraph is that the current strategy seems to be misguided. So this is what the Canadians and Americans are doing. They're throwing more antibiotics at the problem to try and reduce the risk of sepsis, um, which seems a little bit mad. Uh, it seems unsustainable. Um, and that might just be the last bit of the argument or persuasion to persuade the funding person that your idea that your assessment of unmet need is more important than the next person's. It's a zero-sum game um, in that there is a finite amount of money to fund this. I mean, this study need not be very expensive, but there will be some cost to it. Um, and somehow, I think Joe's point's very good, you've got to make UTI sexy because there'll be some application in there pretending to cure cancer, you know, or to, inv or, or to be able to make an, a new organ for you. Um, and they tend to get funded. Um, so we also have a kind of solution, don't we, here, in that this iatrogenic doctor, if you like, induced nosocomial infection can be prevented by keeping everything sterile. Um, but that's kind of old news. Um, I just wondered if anybody's got another subsequent question that they may want to ask. You know, now we've got, so if we've got, we admit that trust is bad, we've got an alternative to it that can reduce the infection rate to close to zero. What might be the next question that we may? 
Yeah, um, that would be one way. But what about antibiotic-free biopsy? Oh, yeah, so that would be a different question. Yeah, I mean, quite, that's a kind of oncological one. But I mean, following this kind of antibiotic stuff. So part of the thing about antibiotics is, is to avoid infection in the first place. But the other thing is to uh, exhibit antibiotic stewardship uh, and use less antibiotics or use antibiotics if, you know, less of them if they're not necessary. And there are a million biopsies done a year. Um, that may be a million times five days of ciprofloxacin. That's five million days of cipro. Um, and a lot of resistance, again, more, more argument, um, is developed in urinary tract infection. So it's, interestingly, it's not developed in the lung with um, upper respiratory tract infections for some reason, but it's E. coli and the plasmids of E. coli that are particularly good at developing resistance in the urinary tract, and we know we contribute to that by exposing these people to antibiotics. So I suppose keeping along the, the kind of unsexy line, these are two questions that arose for me, and I'd ask you whether you think they're timely, legitimate, important, and valid. What do we think? Or not? I mean, you know, there's lots of questions to ask. Um, and we have to say no to lots of questions. And, and uh, all the research we do uh, is a product of saying no or not bothering or um, trying to and not being able to do other stuff. And so... Okay. So, um, so the first is unmet need, yeah? The second is a kind of legitimate, timely question that is pertinent to you and your patients. And then there's a kind of formalization, which we'll go into this in a bit more detail later on, is how we might do that. Um, and so in men undergoing prostate biopsy via the perineum, that would be your population, I might add in men who test negative on a dipstick test of urine. We can discuss that, whether we want to refine the population with a qualification to reduce the overall rate of infection. Do men who are biopsied without antibiotics versus those that are biopsied with antibiotics experience equivocal rates of sepsis? Is that... Is that is that a reasonable question to ask? You know, is the, is the promised land of antibiotic-free prostate biopsy worth getting to? I'd love to, I'd love to announce it. You know, antibiotic-free prostate biopsy would be a wonderful thing to announce. <laughs> Where else have we done this? Flexible cystoscopy is, is, is an obvious. It's kind of happened, hasn't it, without any trials. And we just stopped giving gentamicin with flexible cystoscopy because somebody told us to. You know, it, it suddenly became policy at, at, at UCH. Um, and we just stopped doing it. So it, it, this question wasn't asked for flexi unless somebody knows. Was, has it well, been addressed? No. I, but I do recall lots of local audits demonstrating yeah. it wasn't necessary. Yeah. And that, that may be the way to do this. Sort of a service yeah. evaluation rather than a large randomised controlled trial. So this precedent, right, this is also important, in another area that we've, we, we're doing less, we're, ex, we're exposing men and women having flexible cystoscopy now to less antibiotics because we feel that's good, it's certainly cheaper, and there'll be less risk of antibiotic-related adverse events. And there may be a small cost to that, and then we need to work out what cost we will tolerate in terms of UTIs, etc. Okay, so so I need your help now. So this is the this is the idea. This is a trial 
we could all do, Burst could do it, and basically you could ask the anaesthetist to um, look up on their phone the randomization schedule about whether they get a syringe of gentamicin or a syringe of um, saline. So it would be a really cheap trial to do, but we need to ask a few important questions about, about the study. Um, so I think we've addressed this. Anybody think we're wasting our time? Anybody think just policy could sort this out? The numbers you gave at the beginning, were they for infection rate for truss biopsy or for transperineal? Uh, truss biopsy. But you want to look at transperineal? Transperineal. Is that as big an issue? 10%, um, so who told me this? 10% um, of patients having transperineal biopsy will have some exposure to antibiotics. Um, so, so this is from Cambridge, Cambridge data. So not necessarily UTIs, but they'll go to their doctor and have some kind of event. Right, okay. And that may, that may be... With antibiotics, yeah. the But obviously the rate of um, antibiotic, sorry, of, of kind of uh, septicemia requiring admission is extremely low. This conversation is very important in designing our study about, you know, questions. <laughs> Let's do that. It's going to be, is it going to be difficult to persuade patients not to have antibiotics? I don't know. Well, in, in fact, I... I think, I think we're going to overreact. Oh, well, I, I doubt anyone's ever seen too, too successfully using too many antibiotics and causing a good issue. It's going to be a history that you've done some very well and yeah. without antibiotics. Yeah. And maybe some very angry. Yeah. Is it ethical? I think it's a big enough issue, isn't it? Because it's going to be yeah. on individual patients. I think it might be. So doing less... Studies that are designed so that you do less are really hard to do for the reasons you articulate, uh, but increasingly valued um, as, as, as resource becomes more scarce. And, and, and actually the value, the preciousness of antibiotics increases. You know, we've got plasmids in Europe that are resistant to all antibiotics. Um, we will just exacerbate that by using lots of antibiotics. So I think, I think we can see and maybe this is why the question is being asked now, that the balance of harms and benefits is changing. So that, so that antibiotic, unnecessary antibiotic exposure is bad, whereas had we had this discussion five years ago, it wouldn't have been. And then, then the, the onus was on preventing a low risk of sepsis. But now we can just see it tipping. And, and you'll be the judge, and, and patients will be the judge, but whether now is the right timing. So Winston Barzell was the first. He always used antibiotics. We, we copied his. He, 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 did, uh, he used a lot. Yeah. Um, so what happened uh, is that they used the truss biopsy protocols and applied them to trans transperineal. So people were getting gent and kef or gent and a few days of Cipro. Um, and, and that's the same with brachytherapy, but obviously you're putting something in, into, the, into the tissue. And I think the majority of patients being biopsied transperineally now are being exposed to antibiotics. In fact, I'm virtually certain everybody I ask gives antibiotics. I've not found anybody who doesn't. Jonathan. Jonathan, what did you say? You said it's ethical. It's, it's, it's on the same vein, really, as my colleague here. It's just about the ethics behind it. Because yeah. you've got a procedure that has a recognized complication of infection, yeah. and then you want to completely remove antibiotics. Yeah. But again, when you do trials in Europe, you usually do one or two records for it. So. I think the, the benefits of getting rid of antibiotics are to the population on a yeah. long term. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas to the patient, the risk yeah. is immediate to that patient. There's yeah. no immediate benefit to that. Correct. Patient. Correct. So would an ethics committee be able to, you know... So this is kind of um, herd-directed altruism. Mm. Yeah. Patients rather than, well, as well as the, yeah. the population. Meek, meek.
So if we trust biopsy, yes. So it's foreign travel, being a doctor, sorry, being a clinician, and having a previous biopsy. For transperineal, I don't think it has been done. But the infection rate is really low here, you know, the event rate. I hear about the fact that I think I have equipoise about not giving antibiotics for this. Because for many skin incisions, we don't give antibiotics because we're not, it's a dirty procedure, it's not a dirty contamination. But for the skin incision, I'm not, if I was on an ethics committee, I think I might be. Okay, so, so, we, so for a good research question, you want, you know, people to have different opinions. If everybody's got the same opinion, there's little point in doing it. Yeah? So you, you want to split the room, not, not just have Joe as the, uh, as the uh, non, non dissenter. <laughs> yeah. Probably less. So I think, I think those the two points are fantastic and very pertinent. And I think, again, we need help from patients here about which is the important endpoint. And I need help from the statisticians about running an equivalent study on a very, very, very low event rate, um, which, which... Which is run by everybody in the world. Fair, fair enough. Okay. So... <laughs> um, It's, it's, it's one that I'm drawn to because it's 10%, and you could draw kind of um, equivalence bounds around it of 5% and, 10, and, 11, and 15% as kind of your bounds of um, non-inferiority. Um, and it would address the thing that you're after, which is... A proxy of infection. Yeah. So in other words, clinical events resulting, thought to be a urinary tract infection, resulting in antibiotic prescription. That would be a, a kind of one end point that you could use. But I think you're right. Um, sepsis requiring hospital admission, I, I've never had one in a 1,000, so it's going to be a very low event rate. Go on, and then I'll kind of wrap up because we, we need to move on. So we could spend all day designing this study, uh, but we haven't got to. Um, so I think the issue of blinding is also important. So you could do this um, with everybody kind of unblinded. Um, so in other words, that the, so the surgeon, the patient knew their allocation. Um, but that might influence, depending on your choice of outcome, you know, if, if, it's about the, if it's about the patient going to their doctor, I think I've got a urinary infection, doc, they might be more inclined to say that if they know that they haven't been allocated 
uh, and your threshold for prescribing stuff when you're called might be altered by your knowledge of the allocation. Um, and then the issue of blinding is just how far you want to take it. Is it sufficient for the anaesthetist to do it, not to tell you? Or does the, do we need a random allocation of syringes that look identical so that nobody in theatre um, knows what's going on? So, you know, and the, I think the only point I want to make, none of these points are specific, is that from a very noble question, quite quickly, in, fi in 15 minutes, we get into all these technical decisions that have to be made that make this trial doable. And it may be that we meet one, um, like, uh, you know, the endpoint's not satisfactory, uh, that stops us from doing the trial and we forget about it and wash our hands and, 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 and think of something else. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you'd have some stopping rules in this study. Um, I think it's very, very important. But you'd form, probably formalize this, that. So if you had a run of infections, you, you might have to, or somebody else not related to the trial would have to unblind the individuals. And then if you exceeded a certain number, you would stop the trial. So I think, I think any, um, any protocol would probably have that uh, in. So I better stop, actually. But it just shows that. These, this process is, is an interesting one, you know, and, and, and it's about how you get the truth, how you get the truth in a way that can persuade whole systems of care to change practice. I mean, the MRI story is really interesting. You know, those that were there, I showed you a, a study from 10 years ago that showed us da data that's identical to a three million pound study that hasn't yet published. Yeah. 10 years, so, and, and hyper-acute stroke units, you know, there was data accumulating for years of benefit before people benefited. Yeah, so, um, so I'll just, just leave you with this. So we've got some choices to make. So uh, shall I just decide, change practice and audit? I can do that myself. I can do it cheaply. Nobody need know. Um, do I do a cohort study, which means I have to kind of tell people, maybe consent people to it? follow people up formally, interfere slightly with their um, care by asking them formal questions at a point in time? Or do we go the whole way? Does this question necessitate, and it's a really important question because RCTs are a pain, uh, does it necessitate a random, a random allocation of the intervention versus control? And I don't know the answer to this. How long do you think that RCT so um, on the 10%, 5 and 15, for non-inferiority, I think we need 330 patients. That's, that's a kind of back of the envelope from a, um, a clinical epidemiologist. Um, so that you, we could do that really quickly. And you the know. outcome measure is going to be very quick to measure as well. Yes, yeah. And, and, you, and, you, years, I think. Yeah. and I think you do that within four weeks. So, so if, if, you, if it was that kind of episode of sepsis, uh, and you might do it by a four-week phone call. And then you then you have a New England Journal of Medicine paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Do I just carry on with the next? Is it just running on to the no, next slide, or do we have so to? I think we, um, um, we have to get out, do we? Yeah. So I think. Uh, Make me little. Okay. And there you go. Make me big. That's the first time that's ever been done. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to tell you something slightly different. Um, I wondered at this point whether I should go on with the other parts of the program and I should come at the end. But then I thought, you know, although... Professor Emt and I are very different in our practices and what we do. In actual fact, we're linked in some ways because I'm the sort of NHS consultant that Mark and very successful chief investigators need because I'm a deliverer of research, if you like. And I thought I'd focus a little bit on research opportunities, not just in terms of how you develop a trial, 
and become a chief investigator. And obviously, you're all very keen. And I can see that in the future, I'm going to be watching you up there presenting your big uh, uh, randomized control trials that are going to be highly citable. But I think along the way, it's possible that one of two of you also might be in my position where you can help deliver on research. So what I thought I'd do is just give you a little bit of an insight into how uh, people like me get involved in research. So this is about delivery as much as it is about development. It's about getting started. So eight years ago, I became an NHS consultant in Middlesbrough. And within a few months, I was invited to be a co-investigator on a study. So this is a, a study that's part of the portfolio. It's already been funded. It's running in lots of centres, and we're invited to be a centre participating in that trial. And I joined an experienced principal investigator, and I was the co-investigator on their trial, and I helped them uh, deliver their trial locally and help them recruit. Now, what I found over those eight years is that just getting my foot in the door and doing a little bit to help other people with their research has enabled me to learn quite a lot about delivering research and has developed some opportunities. So I've now been a PI. I think I'm on my sixth or seventh trial that I'm running in Middlesbrough. And two or three of those trials, we've been top recruiters in the UK. So we've, we've managed to build a critical mass and, and develop. And as a result of that, I've been involved in participating in national initiatives to try and develop research interest in various groups. I mean, here's one of them, for example. Um, I've been uh, part of the bladder cancer uh, clinical studies group for the NIH NIHR. And this has all come from just that first uh, little bit of involvement as a co-investigator. I think when you do it, when you take that step, choose something that interests you, find your niche. Bladder cancer is my thing, that's what I treat clinically. It makes every sense, therefore, for me to be involved in bladder cancer research. And then as you move forward, the next thing you might want to consider after having been a PI many times and being part of trial management groups, of which I've been sort of the... What have I been? I've been kind of the voice of, uh, is that practical? Is that going to fly in an NHS DGH, Joe? That's the sort of niche I have in a trial management group. Uh, having done that is then, can you then become a, a, a chief investigator because there's a question that's important to you and important to your patients? It certainly takes time and it takes commitment. And of course, where you are located and how much research is going on in your unit is going to be very much have an influence on that. You probably all know what a principal investigator is, but just in case you don't, this is the person with overall responsibility at an individual site. You have to be GCP trained. Anyone who is any way delegated tasks on a portfolio study can be GCP trained for free. You have to do it every couple of years. And to be honest, as a TPD with, involved in education, I can see this being an, a, a part of your ARCP and your CCT as a trainee as well. So I think we'll all be GCP trained. A lot of us are already. <coughs> you get supported by research nurses, nurses and research assistants, co-investigators. And there's quite a lot of support available through your local R&D department. Uh, also, the clinical trials unit that is running the study will be very supportive. Remember, they want you to recruit patients. They want to make it as easy as possible for you to do that. And your chief investigators, if you're participating in a trial uh, that Mark is running, he will be very happy to advise his principal investigators on how to make this feasible. Won't you, Mark? Of course. Question. <laughs> Especially if you're going to deliver lots and lots of patients to help him reach his timelines for his study. Portfolio studies are undoubtedly the easiest ones to get into to start with because if it's a portfolio study, that is part of the NIHR network, and every one of you in this room will be part of a network. There's about, I think, 12 of them in the UK. I'm not sure if that's exactly correct. It's something like that. Um, then you are allocated resources. So research nurses in your hospital are employed by the, the NIHR to help with portfolio studies. Commercial studies are quite attractive. They're a little bit more complicated, but your hospitals will be very keen for you to embark on commercial studies. So these are where, say, a pharmaceutical company or an instrument company is keen to pay your hospital to deliver a, a specific trial. Now, because it's bringing money into your hospital, your research and development teams and directors will be very keen for you to engage in this sort of work, and it can help you 
in generating a little bit of funding to build capacity so that you can deliver more trials in your, your area. Recruitment is the key factor in reward as far as delivery is concerned. The more patients you can recruit into trials, the more funding will be allocated to you and to your hospital in terms of resource for research nurses and your time. In other words, consultant uh, PA time is, is exactly aligned to your recruitment. Fortunately for surgeons, there is some acknowledgement of complexity. So an observational study where you're just looking at a, a patient record and what happened to them, where you can re recruit many hundreds, uh, receives less resource than a complex surgical trial. And that is fortunate for us as surgeons because many of our studies require a lot more of our time. However, you should also be aware that for your trust and your R&D department, if you fail to recruit within a certain time period or massively overestimate what you can recruit, there are some penalties in terms of uh, finances going to your trust. So that conversation between your R&D department and yourself is important and you should be as honest as possible about what you can feasibly recruit. That's good for your reputation and it's good for your trust in terms of resource. So top tips for new PIs as I see it. I've already said it. Dip your toe in the water. Start as a co-investigator. The low-lying fruit, you hear this phrase very often, it's about picking a trial that is pragmatic and easy to do. So there's an example of one we're just opening in Middlesbrough right now, which is about uh, urinary biomarkers. It's called Detect One. It's run by one of Mark's colleagues at UCL, uh, John Kelly. All they want us to do is send some urine samples from our hematuria clinics where they will test the biomarker in conjunction with what the outcome was of the hematuria investigations. In fact, the PI at our trust is a nurse, our urology specialist nurse, and she's able to run with this. I think we'll be able to recruit a lot of patients for this. This is what I call a low-lying fruit trial. I've mentioned it already. Be conservative about how many you can recruit. Look at what patients present to your department. Look at your business footfall. You need, very importantly, to know how to identify recruits. So MDT pathways are the easiest. And in our MDT, we look at every single patient. Can we recruit them to a trial? Prostate cancer, bladder cancer, renal cancer. Work with R&D and make sure you talk to pharmacy, pathology, radiology in advance about feasibility because for many of these studies, you will need their involvement. Ensure you have some support. We've mentioned that. Be enthusiastic. You have to be very enthusiastic. You have to be inspiring to your team uh, because the rewards do not come fast and furiously. They are, it's a very slow, gradual build of momentum. It is rewarding, but you have to really love your subject and really want and really be engaged with what the question is and, and want to know what the answer is. The personal touch counts a lot with your patients and your colleagues. Always mention trials early. A good example for that is the PAUT trial which looks at upper tract urothelial cancer and this is for patients who are having nephroutorectomy and then they're randomized to either observation or adjuvant chemotherapy. Now one of the key aims of that study is for clinicians who are taking out kidneys to mention the PAUT trial before the patient even has the operation. So the patient is aware that should they have high-risk pathology postoperatively, there may be an opportunity for them to engage in a clinical trial that may address that. And giving them that information, that patient information sheet at that point can be absolutely crucial to the outcome of that study. That trial will only run if consultant urologists taking out kidneys and ureters tell patients about it, and, and they're the gatekeepers for that trial. Asking queries, we talk about that. And the final thing is, remember the follow-up. While uh, Mark and Freddie Hamdi and others are traveling the world presenting their results, you are probably still engaged in follow-up for quite a few years to come. Uh, so don't forget that part. Even when the trial closes, you're still engaged, and your research teams are engaged with follow-up. So I've just presented that as a sort of reflection on a slightly different perspective. But I would like to believe that the role of these PIs and the people engaged in research across the country is just as important as, it is, as developing the research questions and designing the trials, because only these people can make it happen. And, and that was really all I wanted to say on that subject, but thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer questions, but I think we have some much, much more exciting talks to come. So, so, can I, so, so um, I think one of our tasks is to make 
the role of the co-investigator less subordinate. Um, and, and it wasn't, and that was deliberate, you know, to, to, the, the first slide was actually all our collaborators. Because yeah. that was the engine of the study, what made the study different. And in part of the dissemination, anybody who wants to go and present at meetings um, can go and present. So, so all the co-investigators will have a slide pack, uh, you know, and if they want to get trained and stuff like that, we'll do it. If they, yeah. A lot of them will do it anyway, and and we will encourage them to be part of dissemination, to go and speak at various national meetings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, because to get it out there, I think you need more than yes. just one individual. You need a posse of individuals yes. that can get it out there. So, so I think my my only adjustment to it would be would be actually that the co-investigator is critically important yeah. in in, in um, creation running and dissemination. I'm talking yeah. probably about two different co-investigators yeah. here yeah. actually, but yeah. you're, you're talking about, I think, the sort of co-investigator I am on a TMG right. who's helped you put together yeah. the idea. But I was, even as a new consultant, you can actually be a co-investigator to the PI yeah. locally to yeah. get you to find out. I would say that I'm, I would completely support what you say. Yeah. For people like me who are supporting trials and doing the day in, day out recruiting, it means such a lot to get your name on a slide at a meeting. That's really important. It gives credit where, where you, you perhaps weren't expecting it. And, and I have seen a, a change, a sea change, I think, over the last eight or nine years since I've been in practice about uh, people who are presenting this data being much more readily, readily acknowledging everyone who's contributed. And one of the goals, I think, of BAUS is actually to encourage people to present their trials at BAUS so all the people in the UK who did contribute can see the fruits of their labours, which and I, and I and I think it's fantastic that that's that's an opportunity, and the fact that they can present slides and, and then present those talks, yeah, that's great. I mean, that, that's that's what people enjoy. What, yeah. what happens between building up your participation as a co-investigator, recruit, uh, recruiting patients, and then getting rewards in terms of time in your job plan to yeah. to spend on research and trials and the PAs? So. What yeah. happens between those two? So, uh, with another hat on, <laughs> uh, I'm our R&D director at Middlesbrough as well, and, and there's a couple of ways we do it. Well, one way we do it is, is, is try and spot uh, people who, we, who are interested in research, and there's a green shoots program whereby we support them with some, we, we pay uh, the trust to buy out some of their time so they can develop uh, their trial portfolio. That's one way it works. The actual PA support now is run by the networks, so they look at recruitment overall in the region, so ours is the northeast of England, and then they will allocate PAs to consultants in uh, Newcastle, Sunderland, Cumbria, Middlesbrough, and, and do that according to uh, recruitment per specialty area, uh, and that's mostly how it's done. I would tell you, though, that that funding pot is declining, and that I think R and D departments are going to be much more reliant in the future about on their commercial research and research capacity funding to be able to uh, to develop researchers. That that's the direction of travel as I see it. I don't know whether you have any comment on that. Yeah, market. and I think um, all, all linked to BRC, you know, which are obviously going to be usually around the university hospitals because they they're getting most of the funding. And that's flat funding at the moment, but I think it's it's at least it's flat. It's mm -hmm. not declining, and and they they will have resource to allocate two PAs or something like that to investigators. And is that um, allocation for a finite period of time? What happens if the money runs out? Do your trust then say, okay, can we do some clinical work and give you those? Will the trust then start funding the PAs for clinical work? Or do you then find yourself working part time? So yeah, so um, it works in many different ways, I should say, first of all. Uh, for example, some departments will share that allocation between a number of clinicians. Uh, there may be some departments where uh, one clinician has recruited a lot of patients, but they would like their PA or that PA time to be allocated to, a, to support a, a junior colleague who's just getting started. Um, my role as r and director is to convince my trust that the research portfolios of different departments fluctuates. So uh, you can have a big trial where you recruit a lot of patients, and then that trial closes, and then you can have a little period of time where you're not recruiting so many. And I think it's a mistake to stop uh, PA rewards and stop allocating funding to departments in those times when there's not so many uh, trials open. But it is a hard sell sometimes to, to uh, ca uh, cash-strapped trusts. 
to get them to do that. And, and sometimes you're trying to convince a very business-orientated CEO of the value of research portfolios. I think one of our duties as researchers is to inform our trusts very clearly that good clinical outcomes relate, relate very well to research active departments. And there's good evidence for that. And that if they want their hospital to be the best, then there's a lot of reasons that having a good research portfolio, being a very act research active trust, uh, is important. Clearly, if you're a big university hospital, that's, that's a no-brainer. I think the challenge for some of us in perhaps less active hospitals or where they're less closely affiliated with university it is to convince our, uh, our senior leadership teams that it is a very important area to invest in. The, the other way is to become independent yourself. So you use the 2PA allocation to develop or write a grant, either on your own or somebody else, and then in that grant you would put in 20%, 10%, 20%, 30% of your time that would pay you for the duration of the, of the study. Um, or 5% from lots of other grants, from three grants that you are maybe not leading on. Uh, and then you you know, you know can find those t those that day a week that you, so you don't need your chief executive. Yeah. You know, um, and that, yeah. you know, that's the other way. I don't actually get any PA support currently to do recruitment. But I've had that support in the first five years. And now I've kind of uh, developed in different ways, so I, I, can, I can do it in different ways. But, but for me, it's, it's getting people started early on, and then you find your, your way to do it. Anyway, thank you very much. That was more a bit more of a sort of a pragmatic, what, it, what it's like out there in the, in the DGH is to do this. So, thank you. Um, right, who have we got next? Are you going to... I'm, I'm just going to talk yeah, going briefly to, sort yeah. of from a trainee perspective. Um, so I'm a, I'm a trainee in London and um, I've been co-chair of Burst with Viru for, uh, since we started that uh, a couple of years ago and Viru's just taken over from me uh, the bowel section of academic urology is the, the surge rep there. Um, I mean, as a, before I was a trainee, I did did some formal research at Imperial, but I've noticed being since being a trainee, actually, unless you do that formalised research or you're an academic trainee, it actually can be very difficult to be involved in research. I find it very enjoyable. It's very stimulating, and it's almost become a bit of a hobby, really, um, being involved in in the way I have. Um, I think as a trainee. As, as Joe said, when, you're, when you become a consultant, if you can learn some research skills and you know, practice your writing for grant applications and writing papers, practice presentation skills, all these skills will stand you in good stead as a consultant when you then want to contribute to studies. It's good for your CV and helps when jumping through the hoops, which invariably, invariably will focus whether you're core going to specialty training or specialty training to consultant a lot of these interviews and, and hoops we have to jump through will focus on those extra things such as research and the, the portfolio stations. So this, this, you know, this kind of area helps with that. I think it makes your job more interesting um, and adds a bit of diversity. Um, and perhaps most importantly for trainees, it's a part of your requirement for CCT. So if you look at the CCT guidance, research is a component of that. Um, you have to be an author on two peer-reviewed publications or literature reviews and first author on two presentations at regional or national conferences. From 2016, for, so from, from next year, that's, that bar is going to be set a little higher. So trainees will have to do a good clinical practice course, so on research, involvement in research, and in addition, a research skills course. So the bar's going to be set a bit higher, so I think it's going to be increasingly important for trainees to be involved in research during their training. So how can you do that? Being involved in, in big clinical trials is not easy as a trainee, but there may be, as Joe said, some low-hanging fruit which we can get as trainees, which will give us some of those skills. When we are consultants, we can be uh, more formally involved. And in addition, if you want to fulfil these CCT requirements, what can you present and what can you publish? So what kind of research can we do as trainees? Well, this is a, a kind of useful diagram of all the different types of medical research. Um, I've, I've put rings around the areas that I think as trainees 
they're probably the things we can most easily be uh, involved in. So on the right, there's systematic reviews and narrative reviews. The red boxes are epidemiological research, so looking at outcomes data, looking at information that we probably use as part of our normal, uh, normal clinical practice and collect as part of normal clinical practice, but using that um, to, you know, across series, cohorts, um, to answer questions. And, uh, and then case series, case reports as well, I think have a very useful place in, you know, in research, um, although they, they're often overlooked, I think. The type of research you want to be involved in and the type of activities you want to do will require varying amounts of support, time and effort. Um, and I've listed different, the different kind of levels of evidence here. And the higher up the, the tree of evidence you go, the greater the scientific rigor, but the more it requires in terms of resources, professional support, planning and time. Um, the lower down you go, it's easier, cheaper, quicker, more achievable, but it might be less publishable. Often the best place to start is with a, a literature review, literature search. I've put this um, picture in. The Royal College of Surgeons Library Service actually will help members, um, MRCS, FRCS, uh, to do a proper literature review. Um, so that's a quite a useful resource. But it, I think it's a good exercise on its own, and it will inform your research project. What, whatever it is, the best place to start is a literature review. And if it's done well, and we'll hear about systematic reviews, it may be very publishable by itself. Case reports. I mean, I've, I've found in my career thus far, case reports are a really good opportunity to practice your writing skills, practice writing a, an argument, something that's going to catch people's attention. Um, and as I've got older, I've been able to help my junior colleagues write their own case reports. Um, I think they have an important role in research as well, perhaps for very rare diseases, rare complications. Um, or new techniques, new diagnoses. This is a, a very nice paper which really sets out how they can be useful and how you can set about doing them. There are still a number of journals that publish them. I think they're becoming less common, and sometimes you have to pay to publish them now, particularly in op open, access, um, open access journals. But often the, the department you're with may have some funds that can help support that. Uh, the Journal of Clinical Urology uh, publish case reports each issue, which I think is, uh, you know, and, but they have to have an education law or clinically relevant dynamic. So outcomes research. I mean, we collect a lot of data in our normal clinical practice when we're in clinics, when we're in x-ray meetings, MRI meetings, which can quite easily be turned into a piece of outcomes research. The important thing with outcomes research is to, to try and make it easy for yourself. So this shouldn't change normal clinical practice. If, if it does, then it becomes more complex. If you can look at your normal clinical practice and collect good data, you can badge it as an audit or service evaluation. And by registering it with your R&D or audit department, it will make it much more publishable. Most journals now will not accept um, submissions without some kind of uh, statement about the ethical review process your, your thing has been through. So if you register it with your R&D department or your audit department, that's a you know, good place to start. I think the key is collecting the right data. If you go around and collect the wrong data, you'll get to the end of your data collection and you won't be able to answer your question. So defining your, your question and your methods, which we're going to have a, a talk on later, spending time planning, Check your plans with your senior colleagues who may have tried similar things before and can give you some good feedback. Check with people like Viru and through Burst. Get feedback through them as well. Doing a pilot is a very good way to test whether it's feasible or not because if you, you know, before you start collecting lots and lots of data, if it's going to be a no-goer, then it would be worth concentrating your efforts somewhere else. Involve your colleagues. Um, you know, other trainees are interested in passing their CCT and, and having opportunities to get their names on papers and presentations. Um, and so dividing jobs up between colleagues is a very good way to go. 
I put this slide in, a saprophyte, as opposed to a parasite, a saprophyte feeds and gets nourished from dead and decaying matter. And I found one of the, one of the most time and resource effective ways of uh, finishing research projects, getting papers and publications, is to take an idea that one of your colleagues may have started and given up with, or the previous registrar got the data, but then they've left and they're no longer interested. Take, take projects that may have already been instigated and just help your colleagues to push them over the line. Give them that extra bit of motivation or that extra bit of time that's needed to get things finished, written up and published. And it's, a, it's to be a saprophyte rather than a parasite, because a parasite is to the detriment of your host, whereas a, a you know, saprophyte is a more, a more, makes use of something that's already dead. Um, BAUS, now with the national audits for complex procedures, is a very rich source of data, and we've had lots of presentations um, at this conference. I think there's a really good opportunity for trainees to work with the sections of BAUS, um, the academic section or the specialty subsections, to be involved in the, you know, the analysis and the write-up of this data. Um, it's important that with this, you know, this data is used with the appropriate governance and oversight because giving out the wrong message could be detrimental. Um, but working with BAUS is a very good way of doing it. And I know so far I think that the section reps have been involved in that, but speaking to um, uh, the people involved with the, the BAUS audit data, there is scope for other trainees to be involved, and that's something they would um, appreciate too. Turning on to the slide, basically, what happens is then the section committee will look at whether it's been a valid question and uh, will approve uh, requests for that CVT, and we can So Sarah Fowler is the uh, person in charge of that, and data is uh, information is available on the BAUS website, contact details. If you want to do clinical research, it gets a bit more difficult. So you need ethical approval for any deviation from normal practice. And even if you're allocating patients to one or t'other of normal clinical practices, you probably still need um, ethical approval. So even if, if, if you have two fairly standard treatments, if you're randomizing patients between those, that's something you should have ethical approval for. Whether your idea needs is, is classed as clinical research or audit, there, on the um, IRAS website, so the ethics website, there is a questionnaire which will take you through and tell you whether that is necessary or not. Because if it is necessary, it is an extra lot of work. Your local R&D office will advise and support you. Clinical trials units as well are, are keen to help develop new ideas. And the good clinical practice training is mandatory for taking part in any clinical research. As Joe said, that's available free um, to any co-investigators of portfolio studies. So if you're a registrar and you're recruiting patients into, into some of these studies, you're seeing them in clinic, you're giving them information, you should, be, um, should do your good clinical practice and that should be freely available to you. Um, in London, uh, Viru's managed to get good clinical practice put onto our um, training for, 2000, for the coming year, 2016-17, as one of the mandatory training days. Um, and I would encourage you to talk to your TPDs about integrating that into your training as well because that's going to be a, a CCT requirement which puts the onus on them to make provision for um, you know putting that as part of your training um, and that may be something that BURST can work with Surge and local trainees to, to help implement. It's about half, half day to a day or it can be done online and it needs refreshing every two years. Um, this is a workshop which is being it's been held once this year already, but the next one is in September, to look at trial design in, in surgical technology, robotics. It's at the Royal College of Surgeons, um, but we've been asked to publicise it. So if you're, if you're interested in acquiring research skills, um, getting involved in trial design and, and participation, then either get in touch with Joe or Victor, Victoria Murphy, who's at the NCRI, because um, this would be a good thing to attend. Collaborative research. Um, I don't know if many of you came to the first meeting yesterday afternoon. It's often difficult to do research by yourself. Or it's probably always difficult. Um, collaborative research has got lots of benefits as trainees where we're moving around fairly rapidly a year at a time to different trusts. It's difficult to undertake uh, research to gather large numbers of patients or um, uh, things that go 
you know, across years that you, then you have to abandon halfway through. So doing, doing things as a collaborative, it's good for um, improving the quality of the research because you can have larger sample size, more complex methodology. Um, it's probably good for patients as well um, because the, the standard of research goes up. So BURST, which is the British Urology Researchers in Surgical Training, is our collaborative group for urology trainees. This is the first um, study that we're rolling out, and it's being initiated at BAUS this year. It's called MIMIC. It's a multi-center cohort study into patients with acute renal colic, which is a you know, very common occurrence and something that is generally managed by trainees um, with ureteric stones. So we've completed a pilot of 120 patients um, to demonstrate feasibility. That was done across six centers. It's now open, and we aim to recruit 1,000 patients across 20 centers. So for trainees who are interested, we would like to hear from you. We would hope you'd recruit 50 patients, which may take you know, a weekend. It's retrospective uh, recruitment, so that can be done through hospital records. Um, and anyone who contributes 50 patients plus uh, will be recognized in the authorship of the published paper. So do get in touch with Viru, myself, or have a look at the BURST website. If you Google BURST Urology, it's the top hit. That's our website there. And then other opportunities that are available will be on the website, so do have a look. Um, this is a, a nice paper written by Adam Nelson and Vincent uh, Ganapragnason in JCU. I'm not sure if it's been published yet, but it goes through um, sources of funding for your research. So if you're interested in research project and you need some money to, to do an MD or a PhD um, or other kinds of funding, this goes through... Um, uh, where you can get that funding and the types of projects that might be funded. Um, in the JCU at the moment, we're publishing a, a series of papers which are designed to be a research toolkit for urologists, both consultants and trainees. Um, so keep your eye open for those, and probably they'll be put together as a, as a supplement, which might be quite a handy guidebook. The end. In, any questions? I agree completely. I mean, when I was a, an SHO and applying for a number, I didn't, you know, I didn't have the CV to get one, and there weren't. It was around MTAS, so there weren't really any. So I took the opportunity to do research to try and get a number. But my most of my registrars at that time, nearly all of them, had done a higher degree, so a MD or a PhD. And I think it's it was much more common back then. And the bottleneck was you know, to get a specialty training number or to get a SPR number. Now I think there's much more um, emphasis on career progression. And so you can, you know, as long as you're involved in clinical activity, clinical research and audit, you can get a specialty training number. I don't think it's weighted as heavily now in favor of higher degrees, which means that trainees possibly are missing out on some of the, the skills that you learn when you do research, you know, asking questions, turning them into studies, writing, presenting, you know, all the kind of soft skills that, that go with doing research, which is, I think, why we're keen to have an organization like BURST and to have events like this so that those, those skills aren't lost to trainees and trainees can still, because we'll, we'll all be consultants one day, and if that skill set is lost from consultants who need to appraise evidence, technology and guidelines, you know, for the benefit of their patients, I think if those skills are lost, that will be a bad thing. Yeah, I would echo that. I think there's this drawback years ago when everybody had an MD or a PhD, is that a lot of people were doing research who didn't really become relevant until they had to do it because they remember. Um, but national selection now, it's not essential.
hardcore view the wrong hardcore lab based guys like me is this. We are doing a service to some of the evilest people that are alive. The people who started the bottom. Hardly anyone is going into things like research at the end. I, mean, I, I would not like to go into the world. So my question to you is how can Bert or Stern make academic claims because directly and I expect they will be directly uh, more attractive rather than keep on saying this word that you said for the last 10 years, including myself, flexibility. I mean, how much more flexible are we going to be? I mean, I now think the number of people who use the academic pathway will back go into a training number, and we just bugger off, frankly. Uh, and I detest that. Mm. I, t I took that. Yeah. Movies, I don't know. You must have some ideas. I took out a couple of slides on, the, I mean, the academic pathway now is you can do academic foundation training, uh, academic core training, and then academic specialty training, and, and research time is integrated within that w into your clinical work. But, I mean, we've discussed it at the, the bow section of academic urology. There's, it is a pyramid, and there seem to be fewer and fewer people transitioning from clinical lecturer to senior lecturer, and then further up. I think probably in terms of the, the numbers of people who are senior lecturers, you pro we probably need to you know, have dedicated academic urologists who will have better continuity up the pathway and probably fewer of us need to do you know, um, formalized research early on in our careers. But often it's difficult because often you don't, your interest isn't, might not be kindled until you are further down your training. Yep. Mm. I mean, from, from my perspective, coming towards the end of training, I, I would feel much more secure having a full-time NHS job and perhaps going through the, the pathway you know, that Joe's trodden of 
then accruing that, you know, possibly that time and the funding to, to join in research rather than getting a grant, which is a, a finite period of time, you know, and then what? From, that's from just my perspective. really tough, you know, that's going through a training fellowship, intermediate fellowship, and a senior fellowship, all of which are highly competitive. But that's, that's the landscape, because university funding is diminishing, I suspect it's going to diminish even more, given recent events, and so universities are having to be very selective about their appointments, and, it, and, and it's going to, towards these, you know, career academics. Um, but, you know, having said that, on the last promotions round, which I sat on, we promoted many um, um, NHS clinicians who had, who had fantastic academic pedigrees, you know, including some orthopedic surgeons, to full professor. Um, so it's, it's, it's possible. And they built up their portfolio slowly. They collaborated. They had a, a few BRC sessions. They had a grant for a while. You know, they've collaborated with lots of scientists to get PhDs and MDs. They've enabled a lot. So remember, it's, it's not just academia. It's, it's um, when it's judged on your kind of enterprise, your enabling, your teaching, as, as well as your academic performance. So it's, it's, it's a tough, tough role, but very enjoyable. Viru's got a hand up. Viru's one of these people. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your input. Um, we've got a, a talk now from uh, Mika. I should introduce you. <laughs> Welcome, thank you. <laughs> Mika van Helmrich, um, epidemiologist, King's College, and you, uh, you lead the Clinical Epidemiology Unit, is that right? Yes, the Cancer uh, Epidemiology Unit. worked with us before on uh, some of our, looking at some of our outcomes data in, in, in BAS. 
and is going to help us look at how to frame research questions, which is possibly the most important thing I'm going to learn today. Well, I thought, because I can skip some of my slides listening to what you've already discussed, because very often what happens is that clinicians, whether they're trainees or consultants, they'll come to me and they've thought about this interesting research question and they've collected some data in some random Excel file and then we have to come up with the analysis and give them the answer and very often that's impossible because as you rightly pointed out data collection is key if you don't have the data then you know there is nothing i can do about it so i kind of want to take a step back when i talk you through and, and make you think a little bit like an epidemiologist does because what I've realized throughout the years is that we kind of speak a different language sometimes. If, if a clinician comes to me and they have this whole research project, then I would ask them, so what is the exposure and what is the outcome? And then they look at me and they don't necessarily know the answer. And I think it's just important for you to kind of have an understanding how we think. And, that's, and, and then it's all about collaborating. And whenever you want to do something, just go to a, a, stat, a biostatistician or an epidemiologist and help them work with you. Because um, I've published many papers supporting clinicians getting through the, you know, so, and they were all trainees and they all got it published in the end because we were working together and, and we know, you know, that's why we're there to do the analysis for you. But if you only come to us afterwards, then sometimes it's just very difficult and I can't help. Um, so I just wanted to check, you know, this is always how I start, like, what is epidemiology? What do you think of um, when we talk about epidemiology? I mean, surely being clinicians you have some idea but it is really it's a distribution and determinants of the disease in human populations um, and that's kind of the the bulk of what we do we always think of what is the outcome what is the exposure and then we will work with the biostatisticians because we then have to obviously link the information we have on the exposure and the outcome together and I'll show you with some um, like here when we think about exposure and outcome the easy thing that everybody thinks about is like smoking and lung cancers, because it's obvious it's an exposure and an outcome. But equally, it could be what Mark was giving as an example. It could be being exposed to a truss biopsy with or without antibiotics. That would be the exposure, and then your outcome would be whether you get an infection or not. It could be a certain procedure you undergo, and it could be quality of life. It could be a questionnaire. It could be looking at erectile dysfunction. It could be using these validated questionnaires. So it really depends on where you are in the pathway, but no matter where you are in the patient pathway, you always have to think of what is the exposure I'm going to look at and what is the outcome. And you can call it a risk factor or an event. It could be cause um, and effect. And so this is just to show you that very, you know, obviously a lot of what you will be doing is not looking at a risk factor for getting a disease. It's amongst those who have the disease. What is an intervention we can do? So um, we're, for instance, running exercise intervention trials among men with metastatic disease as well as men who are scheduled for radical prostatectomy, and the idea is to look at how being on standard care on, on a supervised exercise intervention is having an impact on um, response to treatment, on disease progression, on quality of life. So then there is a number of outcome variables that we can actually um, look at. But so that's kind of how an epidemiology thinks. You kind of have to define which are the two things that I'm going to link together. And so that is also to show you that We've talked a lot about trials today, but given the work you do, there is so much you can do in terms of clinical epidemiology because there's so much data that you collect on your patients and there's so many little questions that also needs addressing in clinic and that you can actually um, look at. So I'll skip all of this. Cause, um, but then I think you have to have a little bit of an idea of how to do a good epidemiological or observational study because there's a lot of limit, you know, because it was shown earlier today with like the randomized trials and a meta-analysis at the top and then you had the cohort studies, the case control studies. And so you have to also keep in mind that when you do an observational study, you can never claim causality. It's all about finding associations. And the example I always give to my students when I'm teaching is if you think about smoking and lung cancer, we all say like smoking causes lung cancer, but um, about 10 years ago, I worked in Boston for the tobacco control unit and actually, so we worked with patients who were suing the tobacco company because they had lung cancer and they would lose because biologically it's still not really proven what component of the cigarette causes the lung cancer. So despite having strong epidemiological evidence, the tobacco companies would kind of win because 
you need both. You need to have an observational evidence as well as biological evidence, whereas for bladder cancer, 50% of male bladder cancer is due to smoking and 30% of female bladder cancer. But there we know that there is a component in the cigarettes, foraminobifenil, that is actually causing the cancer. And so it's just to make you aware that you have to be very careful whenever you write your observational studies that in your conclusion, and, and therefore I think English is a great language because I'm originally from Belgium and there is no way we have so many words in Dutch to describe it. But in English, there are so many words that you can say that the findings suggest it may, you know, it's not because you don't find evidence. It's always an association that you're looking at when you look at these cohort studies. It's just for you to be aware. Um, and then when you look at all these studies, how do you interpret the quality of these studies? How are you going to, going to design a good observational study? You have to think about the validity of the study. And the way you should think about it is internal validity and external validity. And external validity is the easiest one um, to think about, right? Because it's about the work you've done. Can you apply it to another population? Is it generalizable? Um, and, and you don't have to be that strict about it because you may have heard of these large American cohort studies, the um, physician's health study, the nurse's health study. These are huge um, studies in America that have been um, studied for a variety of diseases, and they get criticized because the people in there are purely nurses, are purely health professionals. But if we're talking about a biomarker in blood and the risk of getting bladder cancer, surely that's not going to be different because you're a health professional. And so that's kind of what you have to think about. It depends on the question. If your question is about um, lifestyle, then yes, it may be that health professionals are not representative for the general population. But if we're talking about a biological mechanism, it's okay. So that's kind of what you have to think about in terms of generalizability, um, external validity, which is important to think about when you draw your conclusions of your findings. What is the impact? How can it be used in other patient populations? But what I mainly want to focus on here is the internal validity because people always talk, oh, we have to think about confounders and bias. And, and so what does it really mean, this um, internal validity? So bias really means that you have, well, you have a lack. No, you don't want bias, so you don't want to have systematic errors in there. You really want to have, in a way, true, true associations between your exposure and your outcome. And so the way to then think about bias, the way I like to think about it is, so you have your research question, which you then want to investigate in a certain study population. So you first have to identify who is going to be in my study population. And then you need to get information on your exposure and your outcome. And then you're going to link exposure and outcome. Those are the kind of the three steps when you think of your research question. You need to identify the population, your exposure and your outcome, and then how you're going to link. And each of these three steps, things can go wrong. So you could have what we call, so when it comes to selection of participants, you could have um, uh, population bias. So you could have selection bias. Maybe you have selected the people in your study for some reason um, because you are interested in a certain exposure, it's more likely that you will also detect the outcome. So to give you an example, I've done quite a lot of work looking at hormonal treatments for prostate cancer and the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so we got criticized because people were saying, well, if you have prostate cancer, it's more likely that you will be investigated, so there is more diagnostic activity, and hence you will pick up more cardiovascular disease than in the general population. And so what we then argued, because when I did the study back in 2010, it, the, the cohort that we used uh, was even from prior to 2010. It wasn't that much, there wasn't that much known about the risk of cardiovascular disease when you were on hormones, so we argued that it wasn't a problem in that uh, specific study, but it's just to make you aware that you have to think about who is going to be in your study, how will that affect, how you will also get information then on your exposure and your outcome. So as I already said, internal validity, you really should think about it in three steps. It's about who is in your study, so you could have selection bias, then you could get information on the exposure and the outcome, where you can also have errors, so you can have misclassification, um, depending on what type of study you do. I'm sure you've heard of recall bias. If you do case control studies, um, if, you, you know, let's say your exposure was diet and it would be your diet, you know, if you're looking at pregnant women and it's about, and they got a child with a congenital anomaly or a healthy baby, and then you want to know how their diet in the first three months of their pregnancy is affecting or is associated with the risk of having a child with that anomaly, Obviously, if you then go into the hospital, you go to a mom who has a sick baby, you gave her the questionnaire, you go next door to the mom who has a healthy baby, you give her the questionnaire, you can see that there's an issue, right? Because 
if I asked any of you what your dietary pattern was six months ago, it'd be quite hard to fill out the questionnaire. But on top of that, a mom who has a sick baby may also think about it very differently than a mom who has a healthy baby. So you can see that there's a lot of issues that can come with how you collect um, data on exposure and outcomes. So that's what we would call information bias. And then confounding, those are um, other factors that may affect the association between the exposure and the outcome that you're studying. And I'll come back to that in a second. So going back to selection bias, as I already said, it's in a way it's those that are in your study for some reason are different than the, those people who are not in your study. And that may have to do with your exposure and your disease. It could be, um, for instance, let's say you have um, identified a new screening tool for um, some kind of cancer and you want to test how that screening tool is affecting um, mortality. And you've decided that the way you're going to select people into your cohort, um, because it's basically you're going to look at people who choose to screen and people who do not want to be screened, and that's your exposure, and then you're going to look at mortality. And basically what you do is you send a letter um, to all the family members of people who have that specific cancer. So that is an issue because their behavior towards getting screened for the cancer may be different because they have more knowledge about the cancer. And on top of that, there may be some kind of hereditary, hereditary component that those people who are family members of people with cancer may be more likely to get the disease. So you can see those are things you need to think about who is going to be in um, your study. So diagnostic bias, I already gave you um, the example. Um, it's not a problem if at the time the, the clinicians are not aware of the issue, but um, you just have to make sure that that is the case. So there is, for instance, if you were to look at um, smoking and emphysema, it may be that smokers, because just because they are smoking, they may go and see their clinicians more often because they may have asthma, they may have other lung diseases, and therefore it's just more likely that you will pick up emphysema amongst the smokers and amongst the non-smokers because they may just walk around with it much longer. So those are the kind of things um, you need to think about. So information bias. So that was all about who is in your study. And then, so let's say you figure that out. So then you need to get information on your exposure and your outcome. And that's when we talk about information bias. Um, it could be differential misclassification or non-differential. Non-differential is not such an issue because that's more like the random lab error that you have, because it, it is possible, you may have heard of the coefficient of variation for a biomarker that is measured. It may just be some random lab error, and, and that has nothing to do with your exposure or your outcome that you're studying. It's just rather random. But differential misclassification, then it has to do, that means that the information you get on your exposure may be wrong, and that has to do with what your outcome is, or the other way around. Um, so, as I already said, so smoking may increase your diagnosis of emphysema, um, and I should say, because I kind of gave this example under selection bias, I should say that epidemiologists do not always agree on whether something is selection bias or information bias. And there's a lot of terminology amongst epidemiologists and biostatisticians. We kind of disagree sometimes on what is the actual term, but I think as long as you are aware of the concepts, um, these are the things you need to think about. Um, another thing in terms of misclassification, let's say you're looking at um, brain tumors, higher incomes, so especially in the States, um, which is related to having better health care. But if you have better health care, it may just be more likely that these brain tumors get picked up than amongst those in the lower socioeconomic class, you see. So that could also be misclassification. Um, so then what is confounding? And I'm sorry, I'm, I know I go fast, and it's a very speedy course in epidemiology, but I think it's just useful for you to have a, a, a little bit of a sense of the things we think about when we design a study. So confounding, um, it's kind of mixing of effects, and, and the textbook example that is often given is when you look at parity and the risk of having a child with um, Down syndrome. So if I were to ask you what direction do you think that association is going to be? So between the number of children you have and the risk of having a child with Down syndrome, would that be a positive association, a negative association, or a null finding? What do you think? Positive. Yes. But what if I am 21 and I have my fifth child? Surely there is not going to be a positive association, right? So there is an issue here with age. Right? H is kind of mixing the effects because 
H is, so H is associated with the risk of Down syndrome. H is associated with parity because obviously the more children you have, um, the older you are. Um, but actually, an H is not necessarily an intermediate in the pathway between your exposure and your outcome, meaning the more children you have, the older you are, therefore you have a higher risk of Down syndrome. That's not necessarily true because I could be 21 and have my fifth child, okay? So that's kind of the classical example of um, confounding, and this is how we kind of show it. So you have your exposure and your outcome, and in order for you to think that something is a confounder, it has to be associated with the outcome, it has to be associated with the exposure, and it cannot be an intermediate in the pathway. So let's look at this example. So we're looking at oral cancer. And I'm asking you, is smoking a confounder for the association between alcohol consumption and oral cancer? So, is smoking associated with oral cancer? Yes. Is smoking associated with alcohol consumption? Yes. But is smoking an intermediate in the pathway? So meaning, the more you drink, the more you smoke, and therefore you will get oral cancer. No. So therefore, smoking is a confounder. And so that's why this is a variable that you will have to collect information on if you were to do a study on alcohol consumption and oral cancer. And that's why I wanted you to think about the concept of confounding, because if you want to design a study, you need to think about what are all the potential variables that you need in your statistical analysis. Because if it actually happened to me that uh, someone came to me and wanted to do a study looking at metabolic syndrome and bladder cancer. And so she kind of started doing her analysis, and then it turned out she had no data whatsoever on smoking. There is just no way you can ever get that published, because smoking is such a strong risk factor for bladder cancer. So she just has to stop the study, because it's just impossible. If it's such a strong risk factor, you, then it is a confounder also, so you have to take it into account. So here is another example. Salt intake, cardiovascular disease. Is hypertension a confounder? So is hypertension associated with heart disease? Yes. Is hypertension associated with salt intake? Yes. Is hypertension an intermediate in the pathway, meaning the more salt intake, you will get hypertension and therefore you will get cardiovascular disease? Yes. So in that case, it's not a confounder. So that's kind of the exercise you need to do. Um, and that is important once you go to the statisticians because then when you want to do, how are you going to take into account confounders when you want to run your analysis? That's when people say, oh, we'll put it in the model. We do, we're going to do a multivariate analysis. I'm sure you've read that, multivariate analysis. That is the whole thought process behind it. When you adjust for things in your analysis, those are the confounders. So you need to think first, do they fulfill the criteria of a confounder? And then you can put them in your um, analysis. Now, I know that you guys are running out of time, so I thought perhaps I skip my example and I'll just talk you through. Well, it's up to you. I'm happy to talk you through, but I'm looking at, because I know you. Okay, you, 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 you skip and then we, yeah. we can have more questions. Yeah, this is, well, yeah, it's a study we did, but here. So I thought I'll just talk you through a little bit of all the steps now, how to develop a research question. And so you really have to think, and you know, I, I think I don't really have to say much more about this because I think Mark's talk was about this as well. Is it a relevant question? Is it going to have an effect on the patient? Is it having an effect on health economy? Is the NHS going to benefit from you answering this question? Um, but also make sure that the question hasn't been answered. Um, an example that I'll never forget is one of my students wanted to do a meta-analysis on um, aspirin use and prostate cancer risk. And I said, fine, I don't know the literature, but you know, you check and then if there is nothing, then you go ahead. So he'd searched the literature and he said, no, there is nothing. So he started off. And then, for some reason, someone else was looking at it. And then she found a systematic review in Nature Urology. Um, and they looked at NSAIDs and prostate cancer risk. So what had happened, that, that the student had only looked, used aspirin as a search term. And so it's just to show you that, make also sure that you're aware of what are the search terms um, to check what has been done um, related to the research question you ask. So once you have your research question, it's going back to what I was saying before, you need to identify your study population. So whether it's patients, mice, cells, you need to think about can this population answer my question. Um, it has to be clearly defined. You prefer it to be representative for the general population, thinking about external validity of your project because obviously you would like to write a paper where in the end you can have a conclusion that is going to have an impact. Um, and the more generalizable your findings are, the more likely you will get it published in a high impact journal. Um, 
then, so as I, I talked slightly about um, selection mechanisms, so make sure that you don't have those issues, but also make sure that you have all the information required to answer your research question. And that is why you need to think about selection bias, information bias, and confounding, because all these things will affect the information you need to answer um, your question. So when it comes to your study cohort, it's really once you have defined the people, it's what is the exposure, what is the outcome, what confounders do I need? And then you need to think about your study design. Do you want to do a cohort study? Do you want to do a case control study? A cohort study means people enter the cohort when they have their exposure and you follow them up over time and you see whether they develop the outcome. Whereas a case control study, it's the other way around. You first pick people, whether they're a case or a control, and then you go back and identify what was their um, exposure. And then, do you want to do something very new that has never been done? Then you're kind of, in a way, more free, I think, in what you want to do. Or do you want to do something and compare it with existing studies? Or is it because there is a limitation in those existing studies and hence you can do something new? Or is it really because you think you have a different study population than what is out there? And then perhaps it's better to stick to the study design that was out there because then it becomes um, more comparable. And there is no right or wrong answer. It's just these are the things you need to think about. And then this may sound very dull, how to prepare your data set, but oh, you will be in so much better shape when you go and talk to the, the statisticians and the epidemiologists if you come with an R and clean Excel file. Because very often, we waste our time having to clean these Excel files that we get from clinicians. Um, because you have to, the way you have to design your data set is it's one row per patient usually, and a column for every single variable that you are interested in. And don't code them with words, code them with numbers and have a key that tells us, see, I see the statistician smile because it happens all the time. Um, you know, because it will be a column where the answer is yes or no, and then what, because what happens is that the trainees have to then create these data sets going through all the hospital software systems, and then, you know, it may be even different trainees that pull the data together, and then one will write yes, one will write a capital Y, another one will write a small Y, and that means that we actually have to check what are all the possible answers that are given for that variable. And then we have to recode them as zero and one. Zero meaning no, and one meaning yes. And so if you kind of have that key up front, or you design your Excel file so that you, know, you can only select certain answers, because it's OK if it's coded as words, as long as they're consistent. And then it's very easy for us. It's not like you can't convert words into numbers. But if there is a consistency, it just um, makes it much easier. The same with dates. Um, people tend to like put in dates in different formats in the same column and it just makes it really hard. I mean, it's not like we can't do it, but it would just make our lives much easier if we would get a clean data set. And given that very often you actually have to go and create the data set, if you can do it from the start, you can do it right, it will just make it much easier. And then the last thing, which is obvious that we need to have an anonymized file, you have no idea how many times I get an Excel file on my university email, which has the NHS numbers and sometimes the patient name and address and the whole business. Um, that's okay. I mean, I do have a hospital email as well, and then it's okay if it comes in there, but actually it can't go to my university email. And so it's just that you're, because it's, because you're so used to looking at the patient data that you don't think about it, but actually when it goes to a researcher, it should be anonymized. Um, and then just something else with, Missing data, people tend to come up with creative codes for missing data, 999, 99998, whatever. You know, if you just leave it blank, it just makes it easier. Can I ask you a question, Edith? Yes. We talk about trend collaboratives. You might find that these uh, trainees are scattered around many different units. Yes. But what is the best way for them to establish a data set that they can all use and share that information? Well, what we have is we have on our shared drive. For instance, we have created, we have worked with the clinicians and created an active surveillance database, which is on the shared drive. And then what we've done is we've set up a training session briefly for all the registrars that are involved mm -hmm. to make sure that everybody enters enters the data. And in that's within your unit. Yes. What if I wanted to be part of that and I'm submitting data from Middlesbrough? How do we do that? Well, I think that it's, we could, you know, there's obviously online systems that we could set up. And then I think it's important that actually that, because I have a database manager in my team, that we set up an interface making your lives easy as well. Because I think that's a trouble with Excel. Yes, it's easy, but it's also very, very easy to make mistakes in Excel. Whereas if we create a very simple interface, 
then and then Excel is on the back end or Access or whatever we use, it's much easier to get the data out and then we make sure that, because then it, there is a key behind the interface, right? So then even you may see words, we will get a number because it's just designed up front. That's very relevant to the collaborative group, I guess. Well, and I mean, yeah, because I work with the trainees a lot and I think it's, it's also just being aware of it and, and what happened is, you know, because I'm giving you a lot of information now. I, last week I taught two days only about this stuff. Um, and I also have been teaching like half day sessions in our urology center just because it's, you know, because I work mainly with urology and oncology and it's just important for people to be aware. Um, so this is just um, an example that, yeah, everything has to be numeric. Um, it's just much, much easier. Um, if that is the only thing you take away from this, I think that will still make your life so much easier because because it's, I mean, it's not like we can't do it, but we literally spend hours having to clean a data set where it's actually when you come to us to kind of run analysis and create tables and give you output, right? So it will just make everything um, quicker. And then I think the best way to kind of prepare your project is what kind of, because you all speak a different language than us dealing with the data. And you may have in your mind the question, but even though you explain it to me, I may not entirely understand it. However, I do understand numbers and tables. And that's, in the end, what you want to have in your paper. So I think that the best way to then plan what you want with a statistician and epidemiologist is to actually create the empty tables that you want to. So you create the tables you want to see in your manuscript, with like the caption, what is in the columns, what is in the rows, but you just leave it blank. And then you can have a conversation with the statistician or the epidemiologist. Is this the right way to go? And then we can modify the tables. And it just makes it much easier for us to create to run the right analysis to come up with the data um, that you're interested in. Because in the end, when you, when you want to write up your paper, you have to write the method section in a logical order, which, well, that's at least how I teach my students. So you write your method section in a certain order, and then I'd like to see the results sh in, in the same order that you've described the methods, and then you write your results with paragraphs, and each paragraph describes like a new figure or a new table but it follows the same order as in the methods, which is then actually preferably also the same order you talk in your discussion, because it's just much easier for a reader or an audience to follow what you've done. Um, so then I didn't put anything for statistical analysis because, well, that could be another course. Uh, but I think it's, it will just be much easier to have the statistical analysis done if you have prepared your research questions, study population, thought about exposure, outcome, confounding variables, and create your data set in a very consistent way. It will be much easier to then run um, the analysis. So when it then comes to writing up your manuscript, so you have to have a coherent story. And, and therefore, and I think that goes back to the point that we already made today, it's all about collaborating because you know, we all have different views. I yesterday sat down with an oncologist and we were looking at our table one, you know, the descriptives of our study population, because um, we're analyzing data from the stampede trial, just from one arm in stampede. And, and we just showed the difference between those who had metabolic syndrome and those who didn't have metabolic syndrome in our table one. And, and the oncologist wanted to have an, another column with p-values to show whether the age was statistically significant or not. And so, Epidemiologists do not like p-values because there is, you know, it's table one, you're not going to change it. Like, this is what it is, they're the descriptives of your study population, you don't need p-values there. And it's the same when you show hazard ratios, and then you show a risk ratio, and then you show your confidence interval. And then very often people still want to see a p-value, but you don't really need it because you can tell from your confidence interval already whether something is statistically significant or not. And it's just, they're little things and clinicians, epidemiologists, statisticians, we all may have slightly different views, and that's the reason why you have to sit together up front and make sure that you're all on the same page, because it also depends on what journal you then want to publish, how you're going to present um, the data. So, I think I already said that, that the order is quite helpful. Um, so yeah, those I think were the main things I wanted to kind of tell you about, but trainees in your organization are very, very lucky because they have access to you and your unit. Mm -hmm. 
uh, my experience is it's not always easy to get uh, input. Uh, I'm sure our statistician colleagues can cover it as well, but you guys are quite rare and an elusive, uh, rare breed like the snow leopard. How, how can the rest of us access, what's the best way for us to get good advice early on? Well, so I guess it also depends a little bit on, on where you're based because are I you quite open, like. Are you open to business yes. with anybody? Yeah, or because I work with people specific? like the Mars and, and like, yeah. it, I don't really, you know, I, yeah. To us, it doesn't, you know, as long as it's also interesting for us and we just have to have a, because, well, it's about the conversation we had before about becoming a senior lecturer. So I'm a senior lecturer now, and then for me, obviously, the next move is to become a leader. But that means I have to make sure that I get enough publications or I'm the last author or the first author. And so it's a matter of, but I'm very happy to help people. And obviously, then you end up in the middle. So it's just a matter of balancing your time mm -hmm. and making, because in the end, well, my salary is there from the university, but it won't be if I also don't tick the boxes yes. that I have to tick as an academic. Um, so you're looking for collaborators who can deliver benefits. Well, actually, well. What, what I think is also beneficial to me is like, for instance, what happened is I had a, a clinical academic fellow from oncology. So she worked with me and she did a meta-analysis and she very much enjoyed epidemiology. So then she and I wrote an NIHR application together because we're running an investigator-led trial now, which is part of her PhD. So in the end, she got interviewed for the NIHR clinical fellowships. She didn't get it, but I, in the meantime, applied for grants. So I have employed her as a trial coordinator. She's taking time out of her registrar training. Um, she's doing her PhD now, and then she will go back, and she still has to do like nine months of her training. So, you know, equally, I'm very interested in having PhD students because my PhD students, some of them very much come from public health, others are mathematicians, but others really are clinicians. And I think because a lot of the work I do is clinical and then I have more molecular work, but I think it's about finding the balance. And, and I think there's a lot of people out there who would like to have um, PhD students. And, and I think that's a good career path for trainees as well, that you also actually get your PhD in. And I think especially clinical epidemiology, because it's a skill that, you will need, you know, because it's, yes, partly it's about trials, but there is so much you can do with the data that you actually collect um, in the hospital. And now it's just, well, that's at least in our hospital, because I also work with the, the Cancer Informatics Board in our hospital to kind of improve data collection and, and make it more, because it's frustrating to clinicians that they actually have to spend a lot of time using these not very user-friendly systems and enter the data because that's where then the national audit data come from. But if you can then actually improve that data collection and make it suitable for research, then that's why I kind of got involved because I have the carrot to get the clinicians more involved to enter the data for the national audit because then we make it possible to then do research on it. Conversation with Baz, so we get yeah. um, one of the things I've come across, for example, is I don't know if you're familiar with the research design services. Yeah. RDS. They're good. So each network will have these um, and it is uh, funded as part of the NIHR network so what I found and I'm not sure if this is completely true but they, they, they have a certain amount of resource so they can't help with absolutely everything but if you've got a project that you are thinking of putting forward for a national grant application for example one of the NIHR programs research patient benefits something like that they will assist you and they do yep. have access to um, uh, people with statistical uh, health economics uh, PPI, epidemiological no, they're very so good. that's quite a useful resource if you don't happen to live within the catchment area of Kings. <laughs> well, I think we've got a natu little natural pause. Um, I think everyone needs to stand up. Stand up, everybody, and, and stretch a bit. We've got some crisps and some drinks for everybody, and I'd invite Gray and Stephen to come and start getting set up if you do so. And get some crisps. Thank you very much. Well, <coughs>
Are you staying till, are you going back this evening or are you staying over there? <laughs> okay. Was the journey out here okay? Good. Well, actually my taxi didn't show up this flight because it was added to me and usually they text you yeah. like beforehand and there was no text at a quarter to six so I thought oh, this is odd. So I called them and yeah, yeah, the taxi will be there. Okay. Then I got a text at six, the taxi is delayed, we will keep you posted. <laughs> He was at the Gatwick Airport. Like, oh. we don't live that well. It's still 20 minutes. So he was like 20 minutes away. So then he took me to like two stations. And then I got to the
program, but despite being brothers, Graham and Stephen spell their names differently. I asked them to correct it. Right. <laughs> yeah, look, it is the same. I think it was um, a typo. Do you, do you want to come and take your seats again? And uh, Graham and Stephen will tell us about systematic reviews. <coughs> So thank, thank you very much for, for asking us along today. Um, I'm Stephen McLennan. I work as a research fellow in the Academic Urology Unit at the University of Aberdeen. And um, uh, Graham is here to present as well. And he is uh, Programme Director at the Health Services Research Unit, also at the University of Aberdeen. So we'll speak about um, systematic reviews, how to perform one. Well, we'll give you some pointers on how to perform one. We, um, so I'll take you through uh, what is systematic about a systematic review and how that differs from a non-systematic review. Um, and some of the things that I'll speak about have already been touched on today. Um, I should also make clear that we're speaking about, well, in this presentation, we'll speak about the systematic reviews of intervention studies and applied to randomized controlled trials because it makes the, the talk a bit more neat, a little bit more straightforward, but you can apply the systematic review methodology to non-randomized studies. You can look at diagnostic test accuracy studies. You can look at prognostic studies. Um, you could even do methodology reviews, but we'll talk about intervention studies in, of RCTs only. Um, so what's, what's, what's not a systematic review? If we think about traditional reviews, some people call them narrative reviews, but I, th I think traditional reviews covers it best. Um, there was a study done in, in the, in the mid-1980s, um, Cynthia Mulroe, when she looked, she looked at a, a one-year uh, sample of reviews in, uh, in leading medical journals at that time. So 98% of those reviews didn't specify where the information came from. Um, 98% didn't assess the methodological quality of included studies. Um, and it was common that the, the authors would choose the studies which tended to support their own biased opinions anyway. And so this, this was her conclusion. So traditional reviews, there, um, we, c we can't replicate them from the information provided in the method sections. It's not usually easy to follow um, and it's not entirely clear how the conclusions follow on from the data. So if we move on then to what is a systematic review, um, you usually have a, a focused and well-defined clinical question. You'll have seen this acronym already today, PICO, um, and we will, we will look at that a little bit further, but I'm sure you've all seen it before, but for those who have not, it stands for a Population Intervention Comparator and Outcomes. So a systematic review usually has a clearly stated title and objectives. Um, it has a, a comprehensive search strategy um, and a, prior, a priori explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria that are applied to your abstract screening and full text screening. We'll, we'll come on to, to what that means. Um, it includes a critical appraisal, um, one of the, the most important points of a, of a systematic review. And, and we've touched on bias already this morning. Um, and it may include a meta-analysis. It's important to, to note that a systematic review, uh, meta-analyses are, are neither necessary nor sufficient for a systematic review. They may be included as part of a systematic review, and I would argue that they should never be done outs with the context of a systematic review because you may be biased to the studies that you include within a meta-analysis that's not done in the context of a systematic review. So in... In a nutshell, that's the, the process you go through in conducting a systematic review. Defining the question, developing a protocol. Um, have, have you heard of the Cochrane Collaboration? I'm sure you probably all have heard of the Cochrane Collaboration. So if you were, if you were writing a systematic review through uh, the Cochrane Collaboration, um, inbuilt in that process would be developing a protocol. Um, if you 
write a systematic review not through the Cochrane collaboration. It's still a good idea to develop and publish a protocol so that uh, that may be peer reviewed. Um, there's a public record that your systematic review is ongoing. Anyone can search for that and find that, okay, somebody else is doing that systematic review. Um, after we have our inclusion and exclusion criteria, we apply them um, to the abstracts that are returned in our literature search, extract data, assess the methodological quality, analyze and present the results. Um, I'll talk about the first six steps and, and then Graham will talk about meta-analysis after that. Um, so to give you an example, what is the best treatment for lower pole kidney stones? A perfectly acceptable question, but it's maybe a little bit vague for conducting a systematic review. So this is a useful template to, to use when you're thinking about how, how you need to define those elements within the systematic review. And uh, we could sit back and forth and I could ask you what types of participants you would include, but I don't think we have enough time to do that. So we'll just race through them just to give you an idea of the types of things you need to be thinking about. And also this is uh, quite minimal information. You would probably need more than this as well. So types of participants you might be interested in. Um, you know, you would have to define that you're interested in males and females. Um, you're not interested in children. Uh, define what you mean by the lower pole. Um, kidney stones, what, what size of kidney stones. Um, and also give idea, uh, an idea of the types of patients you would like to exclude from your study. Interventions, and it's, port it's important to remember when you're, when you're conducting a systematic review, it's not just the interventions that you practice in, 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 uh, in your hospital. It's all the available interventions that could be used to, um, to treat a particular condition or disease. You need to think about which outcomes you want, you want to include in your systematic review. All this needs done up front, a priori. Same as you would do if you were designing a, a primary study. And you would also need to work with an information specialist to give them an idea of search restrictions. So you might not be interested in studies before a, ter a certain cutoff date, but this needs to be clinically or methodologically justified. You can't just say, well, let's cut it off at the year 2000 because I can't be bothered looking back that far. There might be a, a a reason why you want to cut off at a particular date. And also you may be, uh, you may want to ap apply a filter to look at RCTs only. Um, if you have a, a good working knowledge of, of your evidence base, you might know that there are lots of clinical trials and maybe you don't want to look at non-randomized studies. But if, you, if you're not really sure, then, then maybe you shouldn't limit by study design. Um, and language restrictions, that's, we'll, we'll come on to that when we speak a bit more about bias. So you can see that there are better ways of structuring that question about what's the best treatment for a lower pole kidney stone. Could somebody give me a shout when I've been speaking for about 20 minutes so that I can give Graham the heads up. So another thing, he's still over here. <laughs> So, you need to develop a protocol, and the protocol is pretty much your publication without the results in it. You need to pre-specify everything in your protocol. The types of patients, so those PICO elements, what types of people you're going to include in your systematic review, how you will assess bias, how you'll handle different types of data, um, which subgroups you're interested in, if you will do sensitivity analyses, um, I've talked briefly about Cochrane collab collaboration already. Um, Prospero, that's a good place to publish your systematic review protocol. It's hosted at the University of York. It's a prospective register of systematic review protocols. Um, yeah. So conducting a literature search. I'm not going to speak in great detail about this because the best advice I can give you there is to work with an information specialist. Uh, at most universities, um, 
and um, especially in university teaching hospitals, you will have information specialists. If you work with the Cochrane Collaboration, if you are publishing a review through them, you will have access to a, uh, a search coordinator. So you need to identify all the keywords, the medical subject heading terms, synonyms for the condition, uh, everything you can think of that will help them structure that search. I, th I think so. I've, I've never, I can't speak from personal experience, but I, I would imagine so. But it's, it's much more complicated than it looks on the surface. It, you know, it's, it's much more complicated than just sticking kidney and stones into Google and yeah. fiddling yeah, through that way. Asking what their experience of doing this might be, because depending on your hospital setting, they may be more or less experienced at it. Yeah. Sometimes just because you're a hospital and a university, your title doesn't necessarily mean you're good at what you're doing. That would be my advice. Yeah, but I, I would definitely advise not to go straight off and just do it on your own. It's out of all the, all the processes involved in the systematic review. If you get that one, other than getting the question wrong, but if you get that one wrong, then you're potentially introducing systematic bias into your systematic review because you may be excluding studies because they're not returned in your search at all. You want to try and get everything, then filter out the things that you don't need. So, and part of the rationale for that is to avoid something called publication bias, which is a, an overarching term, but it refers to a number of biases subsumed within that. So um, studies with positive findings are more likely to be um, submitted for publication. They're more likely to be accepted. They're more likely to be quickly accepted. Um, people like to try and milk studies for all they're worth and get as many publications as they can out of them. So you may have more than one paper um, with dif different authors. It's more likely to be published in English. Um, yeah, so you can, you can see the scope for bias creeping in. So once you've created those inclusion and exclusion criteria, your, your, your PICO elements, you need to apply those criteria to the, the list of abstract that is returned to you from, um, from your search specialists. So two people do this independently, and again, that's to try and mitigate against bias. Um, it's better to be over-inclusive at the, the abstract screening stage. Um, and once you've applied uh, your inclusion and exclusion criteria, you've got rid of all the things that don't obviously meet those criteria in abstract form you're left with a smaller set of studies, then you go and retrieve the full text for those studies and apply your inclusion and exclusion criteria again. For example, if, if uh, your outcomes of interest were not mentioned in the abstract, it's unlikely you would exclude the abstract. You would go and get the full text just to, to make sure that the, the outcomes are, are not reported further on in the study. Um, important to note the, the reasons for exclusions because that's part of the systematic review process. Once you've included studies at full text stage, you need to give reasons for the ones you've excluded. Um, you can use software to help you with that process. Um, if you're doing a systematic review through the Cochrane Collaboration, they have uh, something called Covidence, um, but you can, you can use things like EndNote or Mendeley or even Excel just to help you with managing that process. Um, Remember, you might not be doing a systematic review with somebody that's in the office next to you. It might be somebody elsewhere in Europe. So you need a way to manage that process because it beca can become quite unwieldy. Um, I'll come back to the pr Prisma diagram. And that was just to give you an example of a, um, a full text screening form of what, what it might look like. So you have your study IDs and you have your um, PICO elements and, and why something may have been excluded. Um, then we have qualitative data for why studies have been included or excluded. And afterwards, we would codify that because there are usually only a set number of, of reasons why you exclude, exclude something. It's usually due to the population, the interventions, uh, the comparators, or the outcomes. So just to give you an example. Um, and this is an example of a, a PRISMA diagram. So PRISMA is a preferred reporting instrument for systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And essentially, that's a checklist to ensure that you report your systematic review clearly. Um, 
and I've circled there uh, that part where, it, where you have to give reasons for why you excluded those studies. So this is, this is from the, the lower pole stones example that we were, we were speaking about earlier. So once you have the studies you'd like to include, you need to extract the data. And again, touching upon something that, that came up earlier, you need to design that form a priori, test it, make sure that you're collecting the right outcomes, you've coded all the data correctly. Um, and if you're not comfortable with designing forms, then work with somebody to help you do that. Um, and what types of data would you extract? Um, anything that can tell you about the results of that study, anything that help you locate that study again, so the bibliographic information, um, and then all the details about the population, the setting, the time frames, etc. Um, also a good idea to do the risk of bias assessment. We'll, we'll come on to, to look at that. But I would do that at data extraction stage um, to save you some time. So common problems when you're undertaking a systematic review, data heterogeneity. You'll find lots of studies all reporting the same thing, but the number of different ways they report the same outcome. So this one is by blood transfusion, I think. So lots of different ways to, to report. An underlying construct that's quite simple to understand. Um, yeah, of course. Well, you, you can't meta-analyze it, that's for, that's for sure. So, sometimes, um, I mean, Graham will be able to speak more about that. You, you might be able to transform uh, data from one type to another um, if you have enough information. Um, but if you, if you don't even know what the outcome is, you know, there's things like something in brackets. If you don't even know what that is, then, then you're, you're on hiding to nothing to start with. Um, but what you can th there is a, an approach called narrative synthesis, which is um, a, way to a way to describe your results and to summarize your systematic review findings um, when you can't meta-analyze. And um, most of the reviews I've done in urology, we've ended up having to use a narrative synthesis approach because the outcomes Narrative, narrative synthesis, um, and I've I've got a, a slide later on where I can point you to a resource that describes the narrative synthesis approach. Um, in about twenty minutes. Okay, so I've got about f what have we got? Fifty minutes in total. Uh, Graham would have um, fifteen minutes. Twenty minutes from now. Okay, I'll race through this next bit then. Um, because we've already had someone speaking about bias this morning. Um, slightly different in a systematic review, especially one of intervention studies um, and RCTs only. So bias, a systematic devi deviation from the truth, um, and we're interested here about internal validity. And the, the simple question to ask is, is this a fair test of these two treatments, treatment A and treatment B? Um, the Cochrane Collaboration have developed a risk of bias tool. Um, I would suggest if you're doing a systematic review of randomized controlled trials to just use their tool. They've put a lot of research into developing it. There's no point in, in developing your own one. It exists, you may as well use it. Um, and to, to, to go through this quickly, um, so a uh, chronological journey through a study. Um, patients are enrolled, allocated to intervention A or intervention B and then they're followed up through the study. So with the Cochrane Collaborations uh, approach, you have, uh, just to give you a, a diagram version, the bias type uh, on the left, left hand side, uh, and the domain that it asks you to assess. So for selection bias, they ask you to look at sequence generation. How, um, how was the sequence generated to allocate those patients to uh, arm A or arm B of the trial? And was there any way that that allocation could have been broken? Could the clinicians or the study personnel know about that? Because it might, may introduce bias. Uh, performance and detection bias. These are questions about blinding. Um, if the um, outcome assessors are not blinded, um, 
to which intervention people had, then it may potentially influence their assessment of the outcome, particularly subjective outcomes. Um, attrition bias, if there was differential uh, loss to follow up, um, that might be related to one of the outcomes. Um, you know, if people drop out of the study just because they move away, it's unlikely to be related to the outcome, but if it's because um, they're experiencing horrendous side effects and you don't have that follow-up data, then that could be a risk of bias. And then reporting biases. Um, this is just an example of the RevMan interface. It, it just gives you an idea of, of what the Cochrane Collaborations tool looks like. Um, and this is the type of information that it that it generates for you. So you see you have the studies down the left-hand side and the types of bias um, in the columns. So it enables you to pinpoint where the biases are within each study, and it also lets you look across those studies. So, for example, the, the blinding of participants and personnel here um, was deemed to be at high risk of bias. So red, red circles are bad, green circles are good. Um, and it's, it's best to, get, to give a, a visual representation like this rather than summing things together to give somebody scores, because then you don't really know where the biases are within those studies or across them. Um, useful tip, use the AMSTAR checklist to, uh, it's for assessing the quality of systematic reviews, but you can use it when you're designing and performing your systematic review so that you're able to answer yes to all the questions that they ask in the checklist. Um, and one, one last slide for me, some, some useful resources. So the, 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 the blue book on the, the left there, the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions, that's an excellent resource. It's very dry, but it's exactly all the information you need to perform a systematic review is in there. We talked briefly about narrative synthesis. The, the white book, um, Systematic Reviews, is from uh, the Centre for Reviews and Dissemination at the University of York. That's the best one for narrative synthesis. Um, and the other two books are, are excellent systematic review resources as well. So I'll leave it there and let, let Graham take on about the... Uh, Meta-analysis. I didn't, I didn't realise my brother put this uh, slide up. But, uh, <laughs> this was um, on the office wall when I first started in 1998. Um, I didn't really, really understand what it meant, but it's even more prevalent these days with the internet. Um, a useful teaching tool is to send your students onto the internet and tell them to find the first medical headline and then try and pull it apart. And you get headlines like this all the time. Um, so meta-analysis. I'm uh, not getting any formula or formulae, plural, in my slides, which I now bitterly regret after yesterday being subject to pictures of penile cancer. Um, I always forget when I come to medical conferences that I, I've got quite a delicate disposition. I had to look away. I want to get revenge with some formulae, but... We'll, we'll skip over the first slide. So meta-analysis, I'm going to tell you about what it is, um, when we would do it, when's it appropriate. Uh, it, it, it's not the panacea that people think it is. It is not a magic bullet that solves everything. So when, what, what are the advantages and limitations of it? Um, interpreting a forest, forest plot and the results that you get, um, how do you perform it, and what pitfalls should, I be, should you be wary of? Um, I suppose I'm going to address that second last one first. I would say make friends with a local statistician. Um, the Cocker movement has been extremely valuable, but one of the downsides of it is the standardization um, and accessibility of things that are actually quite complicated. Um, you know, I, even if you gave me a do-it-yourself surgery kit, I, I'd probably get a surgeon to do it for me. And it, it's pretty much the same with, with, with meta-analysis. It's... Sometimes it's straightforward, but a lot of the times it's, there, there are things in there that you, you might not be aware of. Um, we talked briefly about resources and having access to statisticians. When I started out, uh, people used to buy me cakes and beer. You know, find someone local. Uh, how many of you work at universities? Do you, are you subject to REF? Do you know what REF is? We all have to get good papers by 2020, or you'll be out of a job, essentially. That's why that, it's a high-pressured environment. Don't be pressed on further. But, 
but I have I have three four star papers. Well, three or four star papers. I've got I've got three papers already, and two of them are from clinical cl trainee colleagues of mine that did systematic reviews that I helped them with. One um, with vitamin D and cancer, and another one on selective decontamination of the uh, oral tract in ICU. So they came to me with a good idea, and it was worth my time to work with them to produce something that got published. And one of them won a prize at a conference, got a trip to California. So just find people, take them good ideas, and they'll help you. OK. Cake, cake. yeah. <laughs> find what they like. <laughs> For me, it's cakes. I'm kicking people at football. Apologies to anybody. Yeah. Uh, so you should only ever do a meta-analysis if it's part of a systematic review. You have to systematically review the literature. Otherwise, you're just cherry-picking studies, or you'll be accused of cherry-picking studies to agree with some preconceived notion that you've got. And in the past, that's what people used to do. That's what happens when you read the Daily Mail. Even the BBC is like that these days. They, things get cherry-picked to suit an agenda. Well, there's no place for that when we're evaluating treatments for patients. Okay? So the, the meta-analysis can only be part of a systematic review. And the validity of your meta-analysis depends on the quality of the systematic review, but also the quality of the studies that are included. You can't magically create a, a, a silk purse. Okay? Garbage in, garbage out. Why would we do it? Well, um, these are, the, these are the, the reasons that you'll see when individual studies that are out there, they may be too small, um, underpowered, or, well, once the study's taken place, power is almost irrelevant, but they, they'd be too small, giving imprecise results. Um, can't draw conclusions. They've got conflicting results. I saw a wonderful quote the other day from a chap called Andrew Gelman, who was... Uh, you may have heard there's a crisis in psychological research at the moment. They can't reproduce anything. All these studies were published in the 70s and the 80s about power stances and things like that. It's all garbage. It's all total garbage done on studies of 40 people. Does that sound familiar? You know, a lot of medical research is based on trials that were done on 40 or 50 people. He says an RCT, trying to measure the treatment effect in an RCT in 40 people is trying to, it's like trying to get the weight of a feather using bathroom scales when the feather is in the pouch of a, an agitated kangaroo. <laughs> Which I think is wonderful. I think that's wonderful. I could have told you that was mine, but it's not. Um, I think that sums up. Small, I'm not saying that small studies are not worthwhile, but you can't draw conclusions from them. You need to systematically review the evidence, bring them together, and then try and produce some sort of summary using... Um, meta-analytic technique, techniques. So meta-analysts can give us an overall more precise estimate of the treatment effect, or treatment effects. And um, it's useful for designing new studies. So you'll see there are three or four studies down there that are uh, on the RCT's posters down in the, the uh, exhibition area. And we identified the gaps and used the information from existing RCTs to design our future RCTs. So there's a, there's a cycle of research. Systematic review is useful for identifying gaps and also informing the parameters that are required to design an RCT. It also helps provide evidence for treatment recommendations. Providing a pooled treatment effect is just one step in the process. That then will get fed into an economic model, drawing in evidence from other sources. People above our pay grade, although I don't know if there's anyone above Procar's pay grade, uh, they, they make decisions about what you should all do in your day-to-day -day job. Robots, that's a controversial one. Procar will say it's not. I think it is. But very controversial. It's very controversial. Are they worth the expense? I don't think there's any doubt that they're better, but are they worth the expense? I remember listening to you, Procar, tell me that um, the, the best thing about, about the robot was that you didn't have a sore back when you went home and you got to sit and drink a glass of wine. <laughs> Un unquant yeah, unquantifiable benefits. Um, yeah, so it, 
meta-analysis is just part of a process, you know, and if you, if you get that wrong and you feed the wrong treatment or something that you've got, you know, you, you're, you're quite sure that you've got the right answer really precisely and you feed it into an economic model, then that can be catastrophic. We could be funding, at worst, treatments that are ineffective. If, well, at best, treatments are expensive but ineffective, but at worst, they, they might be dangerous. So, I seem to be downplaying meta-analysis, but it's not. It's really useful. Uh, I, I'm not. It, it, it does let us uh, combine treatments to increase the precision and power. Um, and it also lets us explore differences across different types of patients, different types of studies. Um, you know, would you base uh, the decision to use a particular technology if a study had been done in America, perhaps. If it had been done in rural Nepal, perhaps not. Those two health systems are different to ours. Should we combine those types of studies? Again, it depends on the interventions. It depends on the patients. Um, so the limitations of meta-analysis, we've gone over some of them. Um, <clears throat> Publication bias. Has anybody ever heard that before? Can anyone suggest to me what publication bias is and why does it arise? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. There's only glory in finding something positive. It's such... It's such a back-to-front philosophy, it, it infuriates me. I had a cardiologist colleague, we were running a trial, and um, the most important thing for him was getting it published first with a p-value less than 0 0.05. That was it. When we ran our trial, the outcome got pinged from six months to 14 days, back out to six months, and then back into 14 days. And the reason that it got switched the last time was so that we could beat his competitors to get our trial out first. Madness! <laughs> I won't tell you his name because it's been recorded. It doesn't work with me anymore. But I, I just I couldn't believe it. I was powerless to stop it. So the education of the clinical leaders of the future is essential. Don't do things like that. Run studies to answer questions and publish them regardless of what you find. Key to that is designing as... Uh, it's a research question, but publication bias. It's the, if studies aren't published, they can't be included in meta-analysis. There's even a technique called the file drawer technique, file drawer problem. How many unpublished studies would there need to be out there to overturn the results that we found in our systematic review and meta-analysis? And if the answer is two or three tiny studies, then it's a house of cards. Okay. Because more than likely, those studies are in someone's file drawer. They've not been published because they didn't reach that magical 0 0.05, which incidentally doesn't mean what most of us think it means. So patient selection. Um, this is something that... One of the assumptions of a meta-analysis is that every patient in every trial would have been eligible for both the treatments, or if you've got three treatments in a meta-analysis, in every single study. They just didn't happen to be there. So in a bizarre world, uh, you're doing an RCT, but you only randomized men. And in another world, you've only randomized women. That's fine if in your trial, you could have randomized when, uh, women and you could have randomized men. You might, for some reason, have inclusion and exclusion criteria single-sex hospital, don't know. But one of the assumptions is that the patients are essentially all the same. They come from a population of patients that are going to receive this intervention in the future. Um, the other thing that happens in uh, the studies that go into a meta-analysis is patients are excluded um, from analysis or they don't get the treatment that they were allocated to. 
and different studies deal with that in different ways. So you've been familiar with the expression intention to treat. Yep. So often you'll see Cochrane, uh, they'll say that they included it, uh, all patients um, were included in an intention to treat philosophy, which means analysed as randomised with imputation for people that have missing outcome. That, that never happens. Um, biased endpoint reporting, missing information, patient heterogeneity. Um, difficult to analyse because often it's not described well. You can't do anything about, about patient heterogeneity if it's not been described in the primary studies. And even then, you require really complex, sophisticated statistical methods to unpick the effects of included patient heterogeneity on treatment effects. And you can't do it within standard Cochrane software. You need to get your local friendly statistician to help you out. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, let's just go and have a quick look at forest plot. Have you seen this before? Everyone know what it means? Here we've got uh, intervention to compare kidney cholesterols, uh, removal of kidney cholesterols, and looking at uh, <coughs> what does that stand for again? Retrograde inter intrarenal, yeah, what you said, against ESWL. Three studies, all of them favour whereas you see here there's a fairly consistent effect size. This tells us that there's very little variance between the studies. We have a Again, for uh, that's for small stones, medium sized stones, large stones, and overall, relative risk of 1.21. So, if you were a patient, what treatment would you want? Based on this review. Alright, alright. Yeah. Does that agree with your uh, clinical? Any dissenters? Depends on the patient. Depends on the patient. Seems to be better for uh, larger stones. Yeah, does that agree with your clinical gut feeling? So four spots let you visually combine um, treatment effects into an overall treatment effect. And so here we've got quite imprecise studies because they've got these big lines around them. Okay. So we're following the strength from uh, six studies here combined together to give an overall pooled treatment effect. Um, I don't think I'll go into that one other than to say uh, this was, uh, I forget what this is, it's uh, beta blockers for uh, death after MI. Um, it's a famous graph because after about 1981, they had the evidence. But of course, the counter to that is suspend my trial for stones and the evidence base for alpha blockers and uh, beta channel blockers to facilitate stone passage. So systematic reviews and meta-analysis say good thing. Our trial says waste of time. I won't go into that in any more detail, but do go and listen to uh, McClinton versus Hollingsworth tomorrow. Battle of the heavyweights will be interesting. Um, and one last thing, publication bias. There are ways to assess it. This is called a funnel plot. Um, on the left, that's what you're expecting to see. No relationship between the size of the study and the treatment effect. On the right, we have publication bias. Here we have small studies with a wide range of repeat treatment effects because small studies have got less precision and they've got sampling errors, so you're more likely to get treatment effects that bounce about. Well, here, there's a gap. Where are those small studies with treatment effects out here? This is evidence that those studies have not been published. So that any meta-analysis based on this is at risk of overestimating a treatment effect due to missing studies. 
Um, I've probably gone over a little bit there, sorry. So has anybody got any questions? Well, can I answer that, Stephen, or do you want to? So it depends on the question. If you were looking at, I, I am, so we're doing one for stress, urinary incontinence, um, surgery in women coming up soon. It's about to start. And I think we're restricting it to 19, it might be 1990, because the surgical techniques that were used before then are irrelevant now. I might have that date wrong, but it depends on the question. It is a really good question because you might have, let's say you've got three drugs and you're interested in drug A versus drug C, but there are no trials of drug A versus drug C. And the only trials of drug A versus drug B and drug B versus drug C are from the 80s, but now nobody uses drug B. <laughs> There's one drug that nobody uses. So what, what do you do? Do you go back through time and take uh, RCTs from the 60s or 70s? So I, I can't give you a definitive answer. It just it needs to be... It needs to be related to the question that you're asking and the technologies that you're evaluating. Are, are the comparators still relevant today? So do you mean to say that if you, before you design any future research, you need to have a preemptive research so you know what you're actually yeah, at? Yeah, you need to have a... Con you yeah. planning your study from... Yes, somewhere. exactly. Right. The second question is, uh, that's a different problem. Wait, what, what do you reckon is the minimum number of people involved in that analysis? I'll get my, uh, ask my Stephen, do you want to answer that? We're doing a meta analysis for the Rebus statistician. That statistician could be a systematic reviewer, could be a, a community of clinicians in this very well informed statistics. But absolute minimum, you need two people to do a systematic review because of the parts of the process that need done by two people independently. But I suggest you need usually two or three clinical content experts. Mm. And not all reviews are Cochrane reviews, though. You've got to keep that in the back of your mind. Cochrane's a, you know, it's, an, it's a lofty standard to aim for, but it's not always required. Sometimes a rapid review is, is good enough. Um, again, it depends on the question. I mean, we always have at least two reviewers and a third one for arbitration or when two reviewers disagree, an information scientist, statistician, and usually an economist. And they usually come with their bosses as well. So... <laughs> But we've got infrastructure for that. It's different to when you're doing it on a shoestring. Probably like the surgical analogy where you could do an operation on one yourself, but it's nice having a mate to yeah. nurse, a runner, <laughs> you know, a registrar. Or as, as I, I heard at dinner last night, someone to go and move the Porsche because one consultant had blocked the other one in and they had to go to another hospital to do a, an emergency transplant. It's a different world. <laughs> Would you do that for screening abstracts and titles, or would one person do that? We would do it two people independently for all the abstracts, third person for arbitration, and then two people independently for the full text as well. 
So in, in my department, so we don't actually work in the same department. In my department, we do it slightly differently depending on the size of the review. We might take a random sample of 10% of the studies and double abstract those. Um, it depends the, on the resources, the scale of the problem. Um, Cochrane requires everything to be double abstracted, doesn't it? So that's so nice. Don't require you to do double abstraction, um, and they sometimes you know they give us about six months to do a review, so we can't do it to that Cochrane standard. It just has to be good enough to answer the question for nice. So uh, again, it depends. And is there a limit to the number of your buddies you can get to help out if you do have thousands of you know things to screen? Can you could you have six, seven, eight? Yeah, yeah. We we again. Depending on the scale of the problem and the time that we've got, we would sometimes set three or four reviewers on it. Um, then the question is, do you buddy people up or do you somehow make sure that there's a crossover? Um, we usually just buddy them up, so you know, two would do half and another two would do half. Thank you very much. So, Professor Dasgupta, thank you for waiting patiently. Um, got our final part of the um, workshop. Uh, it's just the arrow there. Just this is forward, yeah. So I'm part of the final piece of the jigsaw, which is how to communicate that wonderful piece of research that you did. If you communicate it very well, then my journal, which is your journal, the BJUI, will put you on the front cover. This is Enclomiphene, the first science papers the first randomized trials all came to the BJUI showing that this is better than testosterone for secondary hypogonadism. These are highly, highly uh, cited papers, and that's what happened to it. So uh, the question is, uh, how do you make your paper good and publishable, uh, not just for the BJUI, but for uh, any journal, in fact? And if you wanted to learn more about the process, particularly those of you who very kindly give up your time to peer review for us, uh, I would encourage you to come to a free workshop tomorrow afternoon uh, where Jay Smith from the Journal of Urology, the editor-in-chief, Jim Cato from European and myself will all be in the same room. This is unique. It's uh, not happened before. Uh, and you can listen and question uh, each of us in turn. So this will be a unique opportunity. It's completely free. Uh, but there is a cap on the numbers, so if you want to register, please do that. So uh, this is a photograph from the top of guys from the Robin suite. Uh, Mika will recognize this, and perhaps as an editor, uh, I can tell you what makes a good paper because I have a helicopter view on where we are today, what is going to make the cut and what is not uh, going to make the cut. We just had our impact factor come out. We've doubled it since I took over. It now stands at 4.387, the highest in the history of the journal. And I suspect uh, next year it will go to 5, 5.5, and, and so on. That, of course, means that the number of papers that we accept finally is only 9%. It's gone down from nearly 40% to 9%. Now, that actually is good for you. So the first thing uh, I wanted to say is if you receive a letter from me which says, I'm sorry your paper didn't get in, then the first thing you do is not think that I am uh, that and I am therefore that, i.e. the emperor in his new clothes, because I'm absolutely here to serve you and not be the bastard who rejected your paper. Because in order to uh, provide you with a quality journal, I need to have those three qualities. They are essential in every editor, and the correct response should be not to take that rejection personally 
and to say, I need to improve the paper and send it somewhere else. About 5% of my uh, uh, authors will come back to me saying, I don't agree with your peer reviewers, in which case we will ask for an independent peer review. But be absolutely certain that in order to provide you with the best quality of readable material, I'm not here to try and block anybody's paper. I have absolutely zero conflicts of interest. So uh, in order to do what we did, we set out three objectives. Uh, that was the first one, and we have achieved that. We had an altmetric score uh, of 1,166. Uh, we made the top altmetrics 50, where we were 44. There is no other surgical journal on that entire list. Uh, nature is the numero uno. So the next was to increase the impact factor, which we have done, and encourage only the highest quality of submissions. That's how it is. Uh, and I will give you examples rather than give you a didactic thought process on how any editor-in-chief in my place selects the best papers, and then you can prepare those papers accordingly. So we have a rapid review system that leads to rapid publication in print and on the web, the web being our main portal, and then we accentuate that by social media. But the underpinning question is the quality, quality, and quality, and nothing else. How do we do that? We have a triage system. Every paper comes to me, and then there is a triage editor or triage editors. They will usually reject the paper immediately between 70 and 80% of the time. The Lancet has similar numbers, uh, about 80%. If they are accepted for peer review, they will go to an associate who can also reject it immediately, and then to peer reviewers, of which there are generally three who will either accept or more likely revise or reject it, leaving just under 10% uh, to finally make the cut. So what is the punchline? And I could stop here and go away and we can all have coffee. And the punchline is this. You only get one chance to make a good first impression. Can't repeat this enough. The title has to be accurate and good. Forget about writing uh, the new results of PSA screening from China. It's not going to make the BJUI because instantly it smells of a regional journal. You yeah? need to think correctly. There's a global journal. We send it to the Journal of Urology. Again, a global journal, European likewise. The abstract, which is the next bit, has to be able to convey to the readership what you're about to say. If the abstract doesn't match what is in the paper, it's not going to make the cut because 90% of our readers just read the title and abstract and that's it. That is the short period of time they have during the day. They just have little attention spans. In fact, we know what your attention span is. You may talk to me about 90 minutes, this, that, and the other. Actually, the average attention span in this room is just under one minute. It used to be three minutes when I took over. It then dropped to one and a half. And in 2016, it's dropped to just under a minute. And I'm responding to your attention spans. You may think otherwise, but that's the truth. Alan Parton said this. So he has been uh, one of my associates for a long time. He served John Fitzpatrick before me. And I think if there's one thing you remember and go away from this lecture, it is this one statement, and the rest you can forget. We don't think, of course, a paper in the BJUI. If you have gone to www.bjui.org, it's completely uh, interactive, uh, and we are interacting and engaging through a variety of media, not just Twitter, but Facebook, YouTube. We have our own channel, Instagram, LinkedIn. You name it, we do it. And even for the ladies uh, who are looking at the next Prada shoes, uh, I have a Pinterest page where you can actually have pin tweets of the BJUI. So while you are selecting your shoes and selfridges, you could, while the lady goes off to get you some shoes, you can look at the BJUI Pinterest pin tweets. So I I'm doing everything I can to get the men in their football journals, the ladies, and everyone out there engaged in every possible way. So this is uh, from Declan Murphy who is my associate uh, editor for social media, 
and I just want you to have a little look at this video. Someone's in this era of big data, one of the great challenges uh, we have Apple as authors is to get deck. our content noticed. And while it remains a great achievement to have a peer review article accepted in a major journal, there is an extra challenge now in ensuring your target audience receives your message and sees your content. We believe that using video, as well as our other social media channels, is a very powerful way to enhance your content and make sure it is projected to a maximum audience. At the BJUI, we encourage video to supplement any type of content within our journal. While traditionally surgeons think of using video to illustrate operative steps of a procedure, we can also use video to illustrate or bring to life the story of an academic paper which may not have surgical content. Either way, the first step in creating a good video is to capture your footage at the highest quality possible. For laparoscopic, endoscopic and robotic surgery, that usually means a high definition digital video recorder. However, there are challenges in capturing high quality video for open surgical procedures, especially when using professional video equipment as shown here. So a practical issue about shooting video for open surgical procedures like this is getting poor access to the surgical field, especially deep in the pelvis. All we tend to see is the back of the surgeon's head. Correct. Correct. Uh, you can... Uh, the alternative yeah, can, <laughs> is to use newer technology like a GoPro to get a close-up view of the abdomen, like this. Very, very practical. You can get a GoPro for about... The other nice thing about GoPro is it can be head-mounted to get those really close-up surgical shots in the abdomen. I don't know what kind of open surgery he's doing. But and he of course, do any. a smartphone can also deliver high-definition video in a very convenient format. So he then goes on to editing, uh, editing is the step which brings your story to life. How his son, it allows you to bring together your video, figures, titles and narration and arrange these so that they both educate and entertain the viewer. A dedicated computer with plenty of memory is recommended and Final Cut Professional is just one of the excellent video editing suites now available. If you find the idea of video editing to be daunting, you could always look closer to home for advice. So, uh, what else? Look, uh, I, I'm, uh, we are running short of time, so I'm going to show you a few examples. First thing is, uh, look at what makes Article of the Week. This is a national study, Be Clear on Cancer, Blood in the Pea. And Graham, you'll be pleased to know this was a negative study, and yet we published it because this is... Uh, to me, a highly important public health message. So we put it out there. And we put, a, put an editorial to it about taxpayers' money and so on. And actually took the editorial from the other end of the earth, from people who are doing similar things and are concerned about what this is going to cost the public budget. We also uh, combined it with a video, as we said. And then, if you look further down on the website, you have blogs at BJUI. There's a deliberate reason why I have blogs at BJUI, because often they are seen more than the article of the week. In fact, I know that you read the blogs more than article of the week. So you can actually contribute to the blogs. We are always looking for good bloggers, including uh, bloggers from meetings. I pay you 500 pounds if you do a nice blog for me, but you have to tell me well in advance. So the next time you're thinking about writing something, we have guidelines on blogs, uh, we will put it. Uh, out there after peer review, and that could go onto your CV. People who come to blogs will stay there for three minutes and then will go on and read the article of the week. Very, very important. The BMJ have also done the same. So here are some examples. The updated parting tables, and I can tell you the next update is coming soon, cited many times. Uh, Gleason grade grouping, highly, highly controversial, highly, highly cited just this month. Six editors have gotten together and written the paper. 
the first paper though came out in the BJUI from Jonathan Epstein going back now 2013. Melbourne consensus statement on prostate cancer screening again cited multiple times. This is the paper which made the Altimetric top 50. Uh, it has an Altimetric score of 1166, comes from my own university. And then MRI, a hot topic. So those of you engaging in MRI spot hot topics. And then of course, in surgical education, we are all surgeons, uh, standardized training curriculum. These are surgeons from all over the world. There are so many authors because they are from all over the world and these papers again are highly cited. One of the new things about the BJUI that we have done and other journals like JAMA are doing it, if you want to attract the editor to something very complex, I've never heard of the Dreyfus model, put in an info infographic. We love infographics, we are one of the first journals to do this. Uh, I was tweeting about this yesterday and again this explains to me what a Dreyfus model is about. So if you have something bizarre that no one knows about, try to make it simple. I love simple things. I'm a simple man. Hot topics, robotic surgery, still very hot. New generation robots coming in the next two years. Get involved with the manufacturers. Do the first in man. Why? Because if you send me that paper, it's going to be cited 40, 50, 100 times. I love it. It doesn't mean I'll just take it. It'll go through peer review. If it is junk, it'll be thrown away. But select a hot topic. Think multi-center, think prospective, think nice quality systematic reviews. And if you wanted to learn more about that, uh, do come tomorrow. So I have been trying to make science simple. As I said, uh, half of my life is as a hardcore uh, at the cutting edge lab uh, uh, research. And I run a large lab within King's College London. And I realized that we often talk different languages. This is uh, uh, gene fusions in prostate cancer. And I got David Bostwick, a famous pathologist, to do this, saying, please talk to people assuming that they know nothing. Talk to your little kid. That's what I want. The kid understands nothing. This shows you how Tempus 2 and ERG fuse together, either by translocation or deletion. I, I bet you majority of people in this room did not ever understand how this very important gene fusion happens in prostate cancer. Did you? Now, that diagram, even an idiot can understand it. And you are highly, highly knowledgeable, intelligent people. So that is the whole idea of science made simple. If you look at our web stats, over 600,000 visits and downloads, uh, mainly from the United States, with a close second from the United Kingdom, followed by Australia and India, obviously the place, places where the BJUI is most prominent. And we often blog first, have a social review, and then publish it later. The Melbourne consensus statement uh, is a typical example of this and important topics uh, that may not make the cut, you may want to blog about them first and then have a social review and peer review. We have embraced social media, as I said, uh, and the question is whether it is important. I will leave you with this years last after video the first Harry Potter book uh, was just to see if you think I'm still social astonished media is important. and delighted I clearly do because she does. Yet. Even though the seventh book and the eighth film have now been completed, I'm still receiving hundreds of letters every week and Harry's fans remain as enthusiastic and inventive as ever. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you, because no author could have asked for a more wonderful, diverse and loyal readership. I'm thrilled to say that I am now in a position to give you something unique, an online reading experience unlike any other. It's called Pottermore. It's the same story with a few crucial additions. The most important one is you. Just as the experience of reading requires that the imaginations of the author and reader work together to create the story, so Pottermore will be built in part by you, the reader. The digital generation will be able to enjoy a safe, unique online reading experience built around the Harry Potter books. Pottermore will be the place where fans of any age can share, participate in, and rediscover the stories. It will also be the exclusive place to purchase digital audiobooks and, for the first time, ebooks of the Harry Potter series. I'll be joining in too, because I will be sharing additional information I've been hoarding for years about the world of Harry Potter. Pottermore is open to everyone from October, but a lucky few can enter early and help shape the experience. Simply follow the owl. Good luck. How amazing is that? Thank you very much. 
really lovely to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Bang on time. Yes. Reinforce people that it should be the recording guidelines for the service that you're reporting on. It really increases the transparency and it makes the reviewer's job easier and it doesn't it's a, it's a massive tip in your favor. Absolutely. And Graham is one is one of our consulting editors, particularly for statistics or so the trials often go to him and often he points out that the basics are not right. Yeah. So, Graham, you'll be pleased to know this autumn we uh, will bring in a trial section into the BJUI where we will pitch all in the trials and we will be extremely, extremely stringent uh, about those guidelines up front so that when you look at it and you say, I'm sorry, you haven't followed it, it's an immediate reject rather than waste a month trying to review it and so on. And same for systematic reviews and meta-analysis, you know, the PRISMA guidelines, stating even uh, that the, the studies have to have a protocol, the systematic reviews, and be registered with Prospero uh, in a prospective fashion in order to make the cut of even going to peer review. So tomorrow I'll tell you we have a scoring system for systematic reviews which is called the AMSTAR score. Our uh, consulting editor for that is a man called Philippe Dam, who is an expert on evidence-based medicine. And Philippe, I have told Philippe this in our meeting in London, I only want systematic reviews with a minimum Amstar score of 5 to uh, an eval, going up the maximum being 11. So if it scores below 5 on that checklist, then it is immediately rejected, whoever it comes from. I don't care if it comes from God. If it scores below 5, it's not registered, it's going to go. So we're going to make those things very clear in the autumn, be more stringent, and save you a whole lot of work uh, as a result. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I'll just go further than that and suggest that for, you know, for those of us who might think about undertaking these studies, don't, report, don't read the reporting guidelines when you're writing it up. Read them before you start the study. Exactly. So use the reporting guidelines to focus your question and your method. Exactly. So when you come to, to the end, it's already done. Exactly. The NIHR website has a lot of very nice information. If you're in any doubt, you can actually see people who have got NIHR funding. They have a whole slide set where they talk about precisely these things, uh, early thought process, how to design it, how to follow the guidelines, how to get funding, and so on. So one leads to the other, and there are, there's a whole load of information out there on the NIHR side. Okay, great job. Thank Lovely to see you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm sure Ben would agree with me. This is an experiment, this course. Uh, when we first approached uh, Paul Jones with the idea, he told me that I was a nerd and that it would, we'd never get anybody to come on to the course. I think he's wrong. Uh, but what I would very much like to encourage you to do is fill in the feedback form that you are going to get through BAUS, and that will give you your certificate, your PPD certificate. But please, would you be very honest about what you were hoping to get from the course, what you have enjoyed, what things can be better, what you want more emphasis on, whether we, and whether we should run it again next year, that's very important. I can tell that a number of you have some very strong interest in research, and so how we can broaden the appeal as well would be really useful. Ben, I don't know whether you've got anything else yeah, to I add. Think, I think without the feedback, you know, we're, we don't know how to make it better. You know, we'll be doing it in the dark, so with, with the feedback of your experience, hopefully we can it. If it can't be improved, then it should be axed. Tell us that. That's as well. also okay. Yeah. That's absolutely fine too. It's 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 very much open to what, what your honest opinion. And uh, I'd just like to take this opportunity to really thank our faculty who've travelled from far and, and wide. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, it's been great, Procar, to have you and Mark here. Is not not just in your capacity as an editor, but also as a leading researcher. So thank you in particular for coming. And. Uh, Enjoy the rest of that. And if you want to approach Ben or I informally and just tell us what you think, that's absolutely fine. As long as you bring me a glass of wine when you do it, I'll be delighted. <laughs>